And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed Reacts. Today, we're going to be covering Jack the Ripper, the most famous serial killer of all time, man, worldwide. Let's get into it. A special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. Fred Jeffrey Williams and Associate Whitesell did commit the felony. Oh, here's what 6 9 actually got. Racketeer conspiracy. This attack shifted the whole U.S. government. This guy got arrested. Espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russian Zodiac Killer is a pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who operated in Northern California. All these serial and, killers got um, Samuel Little, etc. They really get off on getting attention from the media. Here, Jeffrey Epstein sexually exploited and abused dozens of minor girls. It was OJ working together to get Nicole killed. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Fed Reacts, man. Um, today, we're going to be switching up a little bit. We're going to give you guys more of an international case with Jack the Ripper out of London. But before I get into that, man, I got two special guests helping me with this broadcast. Uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Kim. Um, last episode, I wasn't here. I was on vacation with my mom, but I'm back. Hi. <laughs> Shout out to Kim for helping getting uh, helping us uh, make that value show super successful. She was helping get girls. Go ahead, yeah. Angie. Hi, guys. It's me again. Uh, finally, we're hitting with the Jack the Ripper case. Uh, I know you guys have been waiting for this for a while. And, yeah, I really don't like that case. I want to say this. <laughs> <laughs> it, this case is boring, guys. Like, it's really boring. It's just conspiracy theories. I don't know why you guys Look, like Angie, it. Look, Angie, that's your opinion. And they don't yeah, care. Yeah, but I just the, wanna, that's I, it. They yeah, don't care. I, they don't care. Move it back to Kim. Let's go on the Super Chats. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's boring. I just wanted to let you know that no, it's, it's it's your opinion, Angie. It's your opinion. But the people have been asking, so we're doing it. So don't talk about it anymore. Okay. Right. Go ahead. Did you see Jay with $110 says playing chess, not checkers? Very well done, Myron. I appreciate that, man. I, I uh, anticipated that those clowns were going to do what they did and they fell right into the trap. JCDU499 says, Angie always gets an attitude when Fresh does vlogs. Why is she getting so comfortable? What? It's okay. I, I'll put, I'll reel her back and play if I need to, guys. Don't worry. What does he mean by that, though? I don't get it. I don't know. I, I haven't <laughs> seen the, the vlog that they're talking about, but. Let me check out with one. She's been as well, guys. You know, you know how his Latina women get. Sometimes you got to be, hey, come on, man. Chill. So it is what it is. Go, go that's ahead, not true. Says, when is Ryan going to finish talking about lose? Uh, that's going to be, um, he's going to come this Friday more than likely, guys. We're going to talk about 9-11. Finish it up. We got uh, probably, we still got to cover a bunch of stuff that deals with them boys, if you know what I'm saying. And then we got uh, some other <laughs> stuff as well that's in there that definitely isn't YouTube friendly. So coming very soon. And yo, oh, Don DeMarco, by the way. <laughs> Down the, Monko, the homie out of Canada Monko. that uh, gave the $110 Super Chat, man. I really appreciate that. And, um, yeah, guys, like, uh, just to give you guys a quick little background in that, the dudes made 20 plus videos on us. We responded. They do exactly what I anticipated. They pulled that video that they had on us off of YouTube because they didn't want to be called hypocrites because they went there and called me homophobic slurs. But then I make a bunch of jokes on their intellect level, you know, looking like monkeys, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're racist. It's like, bro. I'm black too. You you guys really think I'm actually racist? I employ a bunch of black people that work for me. It's all jokes. You know what I mean? I don't know if people saw the Clayton Bigsby character from Dave Chappelle, but uh, we live in a very, man, it's crazy. Cause I remember when that skit first came out, uh, it did get some outrage, but nowadays it's like bad, bro. We live in such a politically correct world. It's, it's ridiculous. So um, it's called crystal generation. What was that? It's called crystal generation. This crystal? Is the crystal generation. Yes. Crystal We're walking generation. in. We're walking on glass. On eggshells. On eggshells. Yeah. Like so, yeah, people, you know, it is what it is. And, and here's the thing, guys. You guys got to remember. The reason why we absolutely defeated them and exposed them is because when you're a comedian, okay, the worst thing you can do is virtue signal when people are roasting you using things that are typically taboo. Comedians are supposed to be the ones that they're supposed to be the last line of defense against woke culture. You know what I mean? That's why they work so hard to defend uh, Dave Chappelle, when he got hit with that, you know, Netflix bullshit. If you're a comedian and you go ahead and try to virtue signal or, you know, take the moral high ground, blah, 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 bro, it's a fucking L every time. But hey, it is what it is, man. Like I said, they they only have their one trick pony. You know, over here, what are we doing? We're about to cover Jack the Ripper, the most famous serial killer of all time. We cover um, terrorism. We cover true crime content we cover how to make uh how to make money how to get girls we're going to teach you guys tomorrow how to make money on amazon on fresh and fit for money monday so um 
it's it's about giving y'all value, diversified value in different realms, and help you guys become better men. Whether it's through knowledge and true crime, understanding American law, getting girls, making money, getting in shape, um, under getting charisma, getting confidence. It is what it is. And the valuetainment um, uh, live show was awesome. A bunch of you guys showed up. Um, I signed a bunch of books. Took hundreds of pictures. It was it was great. It was a good time, man. It was really awesome to like meet you guys in person, and it really made put things in perspective for me and let me realize like. Uh, how important we are for you guys and how much we've impacted your guys' lives. So, you know, it, you know, playing, making jokes and roasting these guys and, you know, it, it, putting on a hood and all that other shit was funny. I ain't gonna lie. It was, it was funny, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, we got a bigger mission and roasting these guys, you know, it can't be the focus of our mission, uh, even though it was fun as fuck. And they're literally, they blocked me. That's how bad they got triggered from the jokes. So they could dish it, but they can't fucking take it, man. You know what time it is. Any other chats before we get into the episode? Yeah, yeah. we have exactly. 13 chats. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's okay. uh, let's go ahead and go through them. Thank you guys so much for the support. Uh, Junior Choi, $2. Can you cover Jack the Ripper? Yeah. Uh, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> Shout out to Troy. He's trolling. He's from Dallas, a friend of ours. Michaka, $4.99. W. Angie Gaines, W. Medium Mo, W. Lawnmower Fresh, W. Lord Gaines, Chris is a bum, and F. Ana Anus, Anus, and Anus. Uh, Anus and Reach. You guys are the goats. Thank you so much, Machaka. And and the real ones, no, man. Y'all that have high IQ know like wh what they're trying to do. They took that video down on purpose. Like I can't believe their fans can't see that. But then again, their fans are stupid. Let's keep going. What else do we got? J Soul Life four ninety nine. Can you branch Davidson? From? Davidians. Davidians from Waco. Yeah, that's from the Waco. Waco siege. That's a case that Angie actually likes, guys. So she'll uh, yes. she'll definitely enjoy that one. <laughs> yes. She won't complain as much on that one. Uh, uh, Michael, that was good. 99 cents, super sticker. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, Me stroke. Ken Rose, five thumb, bucks, thumbs up. Thumbs Appreciate up. that. Storming, storming, set up a uh, circle versus Donson debate P content. Yeah, we could do that. We could do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna settle that beef between them two because both of them are really smart. I like I I I hope you guys see that Zerka plays a character a lot of the times. He's actually a very smart guy. Um, but he's got to play up certain things sometimes, like you know, for the shock value, which is hilarious. Hey, yeah, I want to hold on real quick. No one knows this. I'm going to expose it right now in Fed Reacts. Oh my God. A lot of you guys are saying, like, oh, Zerka came in and, like, you know, put a battery in your pack and, like, manipulated you guys. Y'all want to know who's the one that told us to, like, chill out and not put the monkey picture, all that other shit? It was Zerka. <laughs> it was actually Zerka that said, no, bro, no, you guys got to stop. He was the one that, like, I, I would keep going if it wasn't for him. So for all you guys that are saying, like, he's telling y'all to do this and he's sabotaging y'all, blah, 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 blah. Nah, bro. I've always been a troll, guys. Just that I don't. I never really showed it because, like, I mean, the type of content that we make doesn't give me the opportunity to really be, like, trolling and making jokes and shit. But anytime you guys see the skits with the hats and all the other shit, that's all my idea, guys. Like, I, I genuinely do like to try. I mean, you can ask Angie. All I do is yes. talk shit. Yes, uh, and true. Kim. I, I literally, when I talk to them, I, I would say, like, 78% of the conversation is me making fun of them. Actually, I just want to say something. <laughs> um, the other day, Myron said a joke on, on the stream with Sneeko. I, it was they call they you call them window lickers. Yes. And Serka liked that joke so much that <laughs> we, when we went to eat after the value team, uh show, he started licking the window. <laughs> he started licking the door. He said, like, "Who am I?" And he's like licking the window yeah, and shit. But he was like. He he started licking the window and then he was like, "Myron, look at this, Myron," <laughs> and he started licking the window and Myron was like, "What the fuck?" He I, didn't I understand the joke. I forgot. <laughs> So I couldn't like, see too. To my defense, I couldn't see. Like yeah. he didn't really put his tongue on it, guys. Don't don't worry. He didn't put his tongue on it. But <laughs> like uh, he was like, uh, he's pretending. But I couldn't see because my vision sucks from a distance. But um, but he was like, Myron, come on, Myron, <laughs> window leaker, man. <laughs> I, I didn't even I didn't even see. It was so funny. But it was. Uh, I was cracking up. But yeah, so he's actually kind of the guy that reeled it in. But yeah, guys, I've always been a troll. Like you know, I used to play Halo Two back in the day. You guys could go ahead. I'll give you all a little gem because you guys are watching here on Fed Reacts. Search like X. Captain Teabag with two E's and then tin, Captain spelled with T-I-N, C-A-P-T-I-N and then T-E-E-B-A-G. Search that shit and you guys are going to see that I've been trolling since like 2006. Uh, always talking shit or whatever, you know, making jokes and all that other stuff. It's just that you guys don't get to see that side so much because of the serious nature of the content that we typically make a lot of the times. Uh, but like if y'all go see me on Sneeko stream or whatever it is, you can see me let loose a little bit and it's more fun. Yeah. But yeah, bro, it's crazy how much of a snowflake uh, era we're in. But yeah, bro, like I'd be roasting people. And the thing is, is like, if I'm going to come and make fun of you, 
I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to use racism. I'm going to use bigotry. I'm going to use uh, <laughs> like the way you look. I'm going to use like your mental ailments. Like I'm going to use everything. Like I don't hold back. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's sad that in 2023, like you can't make dark humor jokes like that no more. And everyone is a fucking snowflake. But it is what it is, man. a and don't want it with me because I am prepared to put that hood on and do some crazy shit and make fun of them boys. Myron Bixby, he's not here right now, but I can make that phone call and he'll show up. <laughs> oh my <gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, what else time. we got? Go ahead. Continue on, Kim. Yeah, we already got a thousand of y'all in here. So like the video. Subscribe to the channel right now before I find you and I kill you. <laughs> 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 okay kevin the fox 199 um ghost 199 you destroyed avon peach <laughs> i appreciate that um, yeah, look you don't even know she said peach <laughs> oh preach it's preach kim come on get it right uh mateo goes hey Myron, did you ever talk to uh, about them boys with andrew bustamante after the show no i didn't um, but he said it himself without me even asking that Mossad is probably one of the most ruthless intelligence agencies in the world. Uh, what else do we got here? She goes, why do you allow non-black people to use the N-word? When you do that, you allow racists to avoid accountability and make excuses by saying my black friend has no problem with me saying that word. Okay. Oh, my God. Fuck. Here we go. Here we go. You guys ready? Let me, let me Let me tell you guys a little secret, okay? As a guy that went to a, 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 you know, a pretty much a predominantly white university where everyone virtue signals out in public, blah, blah, blah. Here's the secret. Everyone is fucking racist. Okay? That's the truth. It's just that some people are better at concealing it than others. Some people have an agenda with it. Some people only reveal it to certain people. But everyone is inherently racist to some degree. Okay? Haram! So if everyone is racist to some level, I respect the people that are openly out there about it and make jokes about it and make fun of it versus people that conceal it. All right. This right here, she like you thinking about, oh, bro, they use the N word. How do you let them get away? Motherfucker, they use the N word when they're at home by themselves. Okay. <laughs> like it is what it is. Words only have power if you let it have power. This is something that the woke left will never understand. These like crazy jokes, all this other shit that y'all see, that's a fraction of what people really think when they're not on camera or whatever. So who are you going to respect more? The person that's scared to say what they want to say for fear of being canceled and then they hide it or the person that doesn't give a fuck and says it to your face? Who are you going to respect more? Both of them are doing the same thing. Amen. Exactly. Yes. The fuck out of here, man. Right, no. Emotional damage. This is why I hate fucking woke culture, bro. That's why I absolutely hate it. That's why like, I can't get behind someone like Akash, right, from Flagrant. He goes ahead and says, you make fun of black people. That's like not good behavior. And then I pull up a clip of him making fun of a black woman not being able to find a guy. It's like, bro, when you're a comedian and you start virtue signaling, you are a pussy, okay? The only difference between me and these guys is I don't give a fuck. I will go ahead and make those racist jokes, okay? I will go ahead and clown you, and uh, there will be no mercy. If you come at me, there will be no mercy. I'll saw Myron Unleashed, and that's only 50% of what I could really do when it comes to roasting these guys. And they're already fucking, whoa, Myron's a Nazi, oh, God. It's like, man, fucking pussies. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, bro, everyone is racist, dude. That's like, that's one of the cool, and, and here's the thing, too. I don't want to digress too much because we still got some uh, Jack the Ripper to cover. But what made me desensitize to racism, guys, was back in 2001. We're going to go back in time a little bit. <laughs> Get to know you guys on a little bit of a more intimate level. After 9-11 happened, guys, I literally got ridiculed from a racism standpoint to the highest degree. They were making fun of me saying, oh, your, cu- your uncle bin Laden attacked us. We're going to go kill your uncle, your other uncle, Saddam. You're a terrorist. You're a sand bigger, if you know what I'm saying. You, you know, oh, yo, you work at a, um, you, you smell, you work at like a, a a quickie mark. Thank you. Come again. I got so, even though I'm an Arab, I'm not even Indian, but bro, I got so many jokes because not only was I made fun of for being Muslim and for being Arab, I also was made fun of for being black too, because I'm both right. Contrary to popular belief or what people want to tell you. So I got hit with racism to the highest level, but I fucking thank God that I did. You want to know why? Because it made me not a fucking bitch. It made me realize that my mind is in, I'm in control of my mind and words can only hurt me if I allow them to, it made me way mentally stronger. So when I hear people say crazy terms, I don't get offended because the context under the, uh, under which they really use it is what matters. Not necessarily them saying the word, but if you're a snowflake and you get triggered when you hear racist terms, bro, 
Life is way fucking harder than that. You need to fucking thicken your skin and stop being a little bitch. That's the problem with a lot of y'all, uh, to be honest. You Gen Zers, you young boys, a lot of y'all are fucking soft. You guys are coddled from reality. Like, and just so y'all know, America is not as racist as you guys think it is. Go to fucking Japan. Go to one of these other countries. Those, that's real racism. You know, they'll sit there and call you a Westerner to your face, Gaijin and all this other shit. Like, bro, the racism in America is child's play compared to other places in the world, guys. So it's a lot of y'all need to like fucking wake up and leave your state, leave your country and realize how good you really have in the United States. The racism that we experience here is nothing compared to other places. People need to grow thicker skin. If a word can trigger you or hurt you, you're a fucking bitch. Amen. All right. Well, what else do we got here? We got three diglets. Predictable, uh, predictable vid, vid by Apple and that elegant swan peach. <laughs> yeah, that dude was ballet dancing all over the place. Why are you not afraid about talk? Why are you not afraid talking about them boys? Because the truth is more important. That's why, bro. Like, I mean, it's it's a fact. Them boys were definitely involved. They're involved in three things, which I'm going to talk about in detail with Ryan Dawson. And go watch Sneako Stream. We talked about this. They're involved in JFK assassination, 9-11, and um, uh, fuck. Oh, and stealing the nuclear bomb from the United States. Can we say that? All, all fact. Right all fact. Them boys. That were involved in those three things. Obviously not alone, but JFK stealing a nuclear bomb and 9-11 absolutely involved. It's it's verified. Mark, okay, we talk about that on YouTube right now. I then I'm not I'm not gonna go in more detail. That's okay. fine. It'll be on Rumble. We'll watch the Ryan Dawson uh pod that we do on Friday. Uh Matthew Gonzalez, crazy how the set chat switched. Yeah, it is what it is. Uh Oops. Jonathan Gale goes, Can you look into Warren Jeff's case? Love the show, keep up the good work. Have you heard of that one, Angie or Kim? Uh no. No, no, no I'll okay. tap it down though. All right, fair enough. Uh, Bauer deal. W. Myron Bixby, love the live show. Can't wait for the next one. Getting a VIP ticket this time. Yeah, yeah, guys. I, it was really awesome meeting a lot of you guys in person. It was fucking awesome. Kim met a bunch of y'all. Angie, some of you guys want to take pictures with Angie, like because of the fetish stuff. So it's really awesome. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got to bring back that monkey cop pic. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. Uh, it was real admirable when you let the Q&A show go on for us cats at home that watch the live show, Iron Sharpens Iron. Yeah, bro. I mean, like I said before, uh, like, guys, I don't do this for the money, okay? Let me be extremely clear about this shit. This is why I'm, like, not scared about doing a lot of the shit that I do. I, I make really good money just off my real estate alone. I can literally walk away from this podcast and be good for the rest of my life. I make enough passive income from, I got 13 real estate properties. I'm about to close on a 14th one here in a, in a week. Like, and this is the beauty i can't be controlled you understand obviously i have to like put things in a certain way so i don't get canceled off youtube so i can continue to give you guys value however i'm not scared of the the woke liberals i'm not scared of them bro because at the end of the day if everything came to shit i would still be able to live very well very comfortably off my real estate alone and that, that's where i want you all y'all to be where people can't tell you what to do with your fucking life because you're scared all right you want that freedom so that you can do whatever the fuck you want to do uh and now we're doing this Fed channel right now. We do this Fed React channel is for fun, really. It's like kind of like it lets us hang out with each other, lets us share a common interest. You guys get some value, so it's great. Uh, Kevin the Fox, Mara, please cover the Travis Rudolph case. His girl set him up, but he ended up killing up one of the guys, and he's on trial for murder. Oh, what a sin! I have that one. You have that one, yeah. Angie. Okay, yeah. all right. Shout out to Angie for having that. Uh, John, enjoy the concept, but props to you for holding frame with all the haters. You stick on your path and keep uh, lapping people. That kill shot Destiny's husband the other day was fire. She was triggered. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um ins immigration shout out to you my friend sorry i missed the live but i did watch it later the link uh it was on was not listed on the live with them in the fnf house hoping to make a vip on the next one it was great watching you shut down melina the blue hair troll yeah she was there trying to be a contrarian but she failed she tried to do what her boyfriend does but it didn't work out too well for her because destiny's way smarter than her uh <laughs> qcc media goes off topic while my friends continue to hang out with my ex-girlfriend regardless of me speaking about it what are your thoughts, Myron? Appreciate all you've done for young men. Uh, they're no mm -hmm. longer your friends, my friend. Yeah. They're yeah, like yeah, facts. Yeah, they're no longer your friends. The Cape Crusader. I noticed you only claim you're black when you spew racial comments as an excuse. You don't have to be racial to be funny, bro. Look at it. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> this is Sparta. Oh, get the fuck out of here if you don't like it, bro. You fucking snowflakes, man. Like this is what I'm trying to say, yo. Nine out of ten times when people make stupid comments like that, like, bro, that's racist. You don't need to do that. This is more than likely what it is. You vote for Biden. You think Andrew Tate is guilty. You get mad when they put sugar in your fucking caramel macchiato because you're a fucking pussy. You don't go to the gym. You're fat. 
You look sloppy, et cetera. You probably look just like Abba and Preach. Every time I get a critique from one of their fans on Instagram, I look at their profile and they're a fucking loser. They don't look like a man that you want to aspire to be. If you're more triggered with words, it, it just tells me you're soft. You haven't dealt with real adversity. You haven't went to the gym and built yourself up. You haven't struggled to make money and build yourself up. You haven't uh, went out there and put yourself in a vulnerable position to talk to girls and be attractive. You haven't done the work on yourself. Because if you're worried about what other people say when it comes to words, you are a fucking bitch. You understand? That's really what it comes down to. So listen, dude, you could go anywhere else. You don't have to watch this true crime channel. Go watch fucking Bailey Sarah and put makeup on and you can do it alongside her, you fucking pussy. Oh my like, God. Like seriously, like you no. guys are so fucking soft. Go watch her. Talk about Jeffrey Dahmer doing her eyeliner like this so your fucking monkey ass can go ahead and join her. Yeah, I fucking said it, bitch. Like, yo, what the fuck is going on, man? Like, Dumb the Marco, like Marco. why? Like, yeah, like, we're not politically correct and we never fucking will be. Welcome to Fresh and Fit, motherfuckers, yeah. where we don't give a fuck what no one thinks. We go ahead and bring people on that Joe Rogan is scared to bring on. We go ahead and have talks that people would never talk about. We are probably one of the craziest podcasts on YouTube, okay? We literally don't give a fuck what the mainstream media thinks or what these gay reaction channels got to say. We stand 10 toes down on what the fuck we want to do and we don't care. We don't let words, racism, oh my God, my feelings, ah. Uh, fuck y'all, man. You guys are part of the problem. You woke pussy. You only say that you're black when it gives you a benefit. No, it's a show, the asinine ludicrousy that all you guys have. Y'all really think I'm racist when I employ black people. I house black people. I go ahead and, uh, with my real estate property, I do more for the black community than 99% of you fucking pussies out there talking shit calling me a fucking uh, racist. Okay, hang on. Like, Where? this shit is crazy <laughs> to me, bro. How, like, these dudes are out here saying all this dumb shit. You motherfuckers need to let your nuts drop and be able to take a goddamn joke. Oh Go ahead. Yes, I'm Angie. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this is Fat Reacts, number one. You all you did dirty to my girl, Bailey Sarian. We love her on this side. On this side, we love her. Man, take yourself off the camera. We'll put it back on me. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> uh fuck it uh <laughs> it doesn't matter what you think oh, all right w live show the other day saw that angie in the back lol well. thank you minor fresh appreciate that uh can you please look into the can you please look into the still unsolved murder case of the boys on the tracks back in 1987 it got covered up by state law officials uh tied to bill clinton who were involved with drug trafficking i never heard of that one we could do which some one? research on that on, one. Which one? It uh, was. It was an unsolved murder case of boys on the tracks, 1987. That's the first. I've oh, heard that. I think. Yeah, I think I know which one it is. Okay. I, I think it was a. It, it was a, a few little boys that killed a four year old, something like that. They just like let him. They they like chop him off, and it, it, they left him on the on the track in the train tracks. Okay. All right. Uh, like that, yeah. Make a note of that one, Angie. And then what okay. else do we got? We got. Uh, no matrix. Can you please look at no got that one? It's Kevin Terrell's next. Okay. Uh finally the Ripper. Also, Myron, you off the chain. Uh Kirk Lazarus needs to make an appearance on the show to promote Tropic Thunder 2. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Alexander goes, Thank you for all the work you do. I enjoy watching your videos. Thank you so much for my friend. Duan uh Duan Richmond goes, To all my brothers, your white friends uh use the N-word when you're not around, especially when listening to music and joking with their friends. Yeah, bro. Facts. Like when I was in college, like like they they that's what they do. They like literally wait, they close the door. Yeah. <laughs> and they just like whisper that shit, but they do it, bro. I'm did telling you. Guys, did you guys never watch like White Chicks, the movie? They they're like, I mean, you can see the joke there. You you can see the joke. They're there. making a bunch of racist jokes there. Yeah. Uh what do what do we got next? Uh Terpsky 101 goes, I'm curious, since the girls work for you, do you pay them? Big fan of uh was just thinking about it earlier, by the way. Angie, you're beautiful. Aww. Uh, Daddy Myron, I appreciate that, my friend. No, I have a bunch of slaves since I'm a racist. Let's keep going. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. Uh, dudes that whine about the N-word are coping for their lack of receiving the V-word. Uh, REI 12 figures. Absolutely, yeah. Vaginas. That's what they are. Oh, my God. Um, let's keep going. Uh, J So Life, INS Immigration to chat. I got to run. Yeah, bro. Like, yo, like, we got a dude in here posing as immigration. Like, bro, we really don't give a fuck over here. Myron's losing his voice. And again. I'm losing my voice. Be down to cover Netflix making murderer. Uh, okay, Angie, we got to do this one. They, this is like the 20th time they've asked for making a murderer. Do you um, have that on the list? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, we'll go back. Go back to that chat so I can finish reading it with the making a murder one. Oh, let me find it there. 
That's it was fine. the one that you just had. Okay, yeah, 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 she'll pull fine. it back up. Yeah. Who are them boys? I'm lost. Can you fill me in? Thanks. Uh, if you don't know who them boys are, well, hey, bro, you need to watch some more yeah. of our channel. <laughs> All I'm going to say is. Hey, there you go. There's a there's a tip for you. <laughs> um, John, salute to Reddit. You guys should cover you, young Chul, a Korean man who ate 26. What the fuck? 20. What? He ate 26 people. <laughs> okay, let me type it out. What the fuck? All right, we'll write that one down. And remember, it's Fed Reacts now, guys, not Fed It. Uh, Angie C smell like Dahmer's apartment. Woody, Woody, Duty, W Duty, Booty. What, <laughs> what the fuck? That's okay. from Dwayne Hama. Uh, didn't want the female on the late night show thinking that I donated because of them. Appreciate the value you guys bring. And that's from Alexander. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate that greatly. Lewis, five bucks. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Israel goes, uh, thank you, Marin and FNF crew for the content you do, you do Zerka's top content. Shout out to my boy, Oscar TTV Goblin. We lose a weight for health. Fasting works. Hey, bro, that's what it's about, man. I tell you all the time, you can't be fat. Uh, Myron, when will Ryan Dawson be back on? It's been two weeks of this Friday he's streaming on Rumble, so I know he's available. T. All right. So this Friday, guys, we obviously couldn't do it because we had the Valuetainment uh, episode. And the, the week, the Friday prior, he had a family emergency that he had to deal with. So that's why. So it wasn't us, guys. It's just that he literally had some stuff come up. But it's going to be this Friday, part two of the 9-11 series, guys. It's going to be awesome. We're going to cover more of the angle of uh, them boys. All right, 10 bucks, Eric J. Oh, no, we read that one? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I've been waiting for this episode. Keep it the good work. Also, any thoughts of having Nick on a full length podcast? Maybe Rumble only. I'm in talks of making it happen, guys. Uh, I think Nick Fuentes is definitely misunderstood, and he's an extremely smart individual. If you actually like take your feelings out of it and listen to what he has to say, he's very intelligent. Very, very intelligent. Uh, I, I genuinely enjoyed the discussions I have with him on the Sneeko stream. Um, I love the content. I really miss the fitness stuff you used to do before blowing up. Don't worry, bro. I still got a fitness playlist. Go back and you'll find it. Uh, Shara Malik. Uh, we do uh, Money Monday on medical insurance slash expenses. It's the biggest reason for bankruptcy in the U.S. I plan to move to U.S. So I was worried a little bit. Uh, that wasn't on in my mind, but if I get enough people asking for it, we'll do it. And then I think these are the last two here. Mm -hmm. um, we got here. Luis goes married from NYC 23. Should I do a city job? or work an office job to make money to ultimately get into real estate top risk should I take? Um, here's the thing, bro. At 23 years old, you can afford to go ahead and take the risk. So go with whatever is going to make you the most money. If that means you got to work more hours, that's fine. But when you're younger, uh, like fuck your freedom and having fun. Like that's when you want to settle down and grind. Like I, too many guys make the card a mistake of like not working hard enough in their twenties. And then they have to pay for it later on in their thirties. You don't want that. You want to work really hard in your twenties so that you can enjoy your thirties. That's kind of what I, what I'm doing now. Right. I suffered in my twenties guys. I didn't party. I didn't go out. I didn't do nothing. I was on the fucking Southwest border chasing after cartel people every day. You know what I mean? So it is what it is. Cut up. Uh, this one and one more. Okay. Uh, Yolan, Zolan goes, Myron, your bravery is admirable, but you are more valuable to men and to the culture with a YouTube channel. Attack the culture from within. Don't let these pro milkshakes be the only ones on YouTube. I appreciate that, my friend. I see what you did there. Uh, what well, would you get a part time job or use the time to learn strategies for side hustle slash knowledge? Um, it depends if the side hustle that you're going to do is going to make you a significant amount of money. You understand? You got to it's a it's a, you got to weigh the costs and the benefits. There's two more. Do you want to read those? We can leave it like we can leave them for, for later. Yeah, we'll leave those for later for now. Okay. Um, and we'll go ahead and go into it because we're already 28 yeah. eight minutes in. So, real quick, guys, uh, before we get into it, if you're just joining us, thank you very much. I appreciate it greatly. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you to Kim and Angie being in the back helping out. Um, Angie's on the ones and twos helping with the cameras, and then Kim is gonna be monitoring the chats, etc. And she'll read some of your super chats. I promise she'll use a little bit more charisma, guys, when she reads some of your chats. <laughs> Uh, we've been roasting her about that. So she's going to self-improve on that. Uh, but today's topic, guys, we're going to talk about Jack the Ripper, okay? Jack the Ripper, probably one of the most infamous serial killers of all time. He was going crazy in the late 19th century, murdering people all over um, East London. Uh, we got a documentary that we're going to use uh, for it. But real quick, before we get into it, let's go a quick little pull up the Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. Angie, please. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, first tab, first tab. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's no. just that you moved this thing here. Yeah. All right. So Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer active and uh, in and around the impoverished Whitechapel District of London, England, in the autumn of 1888. In both criminal case 
files and the contemporary, com contemporaneous journalistic accounts, the killer was called the Whitechapel murderer and the leather apron. You guys going to see how we got that nickname, the leather um, apron, when we do our little uh, breakdown. Attacks described to Jack the Ripper typically involved women working as prostitutes who lived and worked in the slums of the East End of London. The throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations. The removal of internal organs from at least three of the victims led to speculation that their killer had some anatomical or surgical knowledge. Rumors uh, that the murderers, the murders were connected, intensified in September and October 1888, and numerous letters were received by media outlets in Scotland Yard from individuals purporting to be the murderers. So, guys, this dude right here was sending letters to the media. Who else used to do that? Mm -hmm. hmm. And the Zodiac Killer. BTK, etc. David Berkowitz as well, the son of Sam, which that was an awesome episode, episode that we did as well, guys. Go back and watch that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, anytime a serial killer starts writing letters to the press, etc., that's the number one way to start to pretty much become famous. So um, I think I think it's very it's almost undisputed at this point that uh Jack the Ripper is the most famous serial killer of all time. Uh, that transcends countries and continents. Um, and then I would say the most famous serial killer in the United States is a Zodiac killer, I would say, because both of them are unsolved. And they used to write letters to the press, et cetera. BTK was big as well, and he also wrote letters, and so did the Son of Sam, but they got caught. It's always crazier when the person doesn't get caught. So um, so today, guys, we're going to react to a, a video from Lamino, okay? Uh, we used his, uh, we um, reacted to him last week with uh, D.B. Cooper. So um, this is going to be fun. We're going to go ahead and uh, play this thing and stop it for some commentary. This was a very well put together video. So don't forget to like his video and give him a subscription as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, let's, without further ado, you guys have anything before we get into this thing and play it? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Someone in the chat said Jack really got them hoes. <laughs> Yo, man, you guys are fucking. That was easy. All right, let's go ahead and run the video and uh, enlarge it on there and please, Angie. Oh, yeah, th this is about to be violent, by the way, guys, so be prepared. All right. In the late 19th century, the city of London was the largest in the world, a sprawling metropolis and a melting pot for trade, finance, and people. But in the autumn of 1888, an horrific story emerged from the capital's east end. A story so dreadful, it sent shockwaves around the world. One after another, destitute women of the east end fell victim to a vicious killer known as Jack the Ripper. Despite an extensive manhunt and a few close calls, the Ripper was never caught. Instead, the murders came to an abrupt end and left behind one of the greatest mysteries in the annals of crime. In the East End of London, there's a district known as Whitechapel. In the late 19th century, Whitechapel was known for its overcrowded slums where many of the capital's poor and unemployed had taken refuge. Day and night, an army of policemen would constantly patrol this labyrinthine network of dim-lit streets, courts, and alleys. One such place was a narrow passage Pause. known as George Yard. Just so you guys know, um, morale with the police department back then was extremely low. Like, they hated their jobs, they were underpaid, underfunded, um, and underrepresented. So. Um, it was very difficult for them to uh, um, <clears throat> to get the job done with the really bad morale. And I'll tell you guys this coming from a law enforcement background. Anytime your um, your guys have bad morale, they're not going to take the job seriously and they're not going to feel that duty to uphold um, the law and protect them. They're not going to go the extra mile, which uh, played right into Jack the Ripper's hands as to I think it was a very big factor in him not getting caught. That's so, also... Um, go ahead. Sorry. That, that also um, calls for like corruption, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let's keep running the clip. Hang on. I don't know what to do this properly. Near the north entrance of this passage was a residential complex known as George Yard Buildings. It was the morning of August the 7th, 1888, when an upstairs tenant named John Reeves headed out for work. 
Upon reaching the first floor landing, Reeves encountered the body of a woman lying upon her back in a pool of blood. Horrified by the sight, he stumbled down to the street below in search for help. Constable Thomas Barrett was the first officer on the scene. He was soon joined by Dr. Timothy Killeen, who conducted a brief examination. The woman had been stabbed 39 times, primarily in the chest and abdomen. Dr. Colleen estimated that she had been dead for, quote, about three hours, thus placing the time of death at approximately 2.30 in the morning. The woman had likely been attacked where she was found, as no blood... Hold on one sec, guys. I'm going to go ahead and adjust something real quick on our end here. Give me one second. I... Uh... Because Angie doesn't know how to do this, so I should have showed her this. Um, but yeah, guys, as you can see, shit's about to get crazy right now with this dude. Um, hold on, let me just adjust this real fast. I use the the Chris excuse. Oh, we do it live. We do it live. We do it live, guys. <laughs> <laughs> as he says every time, he was he was off that henny though that night. Okay, boom. All right, now we got it correctly. All right, cool. Let's get back into it, guys. It was found beyond. Apologize for that. The staircase landing. But this was strange, as none of the tenants in this crowded building had heard a single cry for help or a disturbance of any kind. One exception was Amy Hewitt, a tenant who claimed to have heard a lone cry of murder. But this was early in the evening of August the 6th, and the scream had emanated from outside the complex. Hewitt further explained, The district round here is rather rough and cries of murder are a frequent, if not nightly, occurrence. The victim was eventually identified as 39-year-old Martha Tabram. Tabram was a mother of two and had separated from her husband many years prior. Her last known address was 19 George Street, a common lodging house less than 300 meters from the site of her death. Tabram had made a living through prostitution, and one of her associates was a woman named Marianne Connolly, Connolly testified that on the evening of August the 6th, she and Tabram had been out drinking with two soldiers. Pause. Then, shortly before midnight, the party of four Pause. had separated. Yeah, so guys, just so you know, in the Victorian era back here in uh, the U London, it was uh, very common for, um, <clears throat> for women of the night to be walking the streets, and prostitution was extremely common. Those, if I'm not mistaken, during this period, there were around 60-plus brothels in, in East London alone. So... This is just how a lot of women made their ends meet that were even some women that were married, because at this point, the East End of London, guys, is one of the poorest places in London. And it was filled with uh, Jewish immigrants, Irish, etc. And uh, there was constant crime, constant fighting, constant turmoil in this part of London. So even married women were out here on the streets. She was wild. A.K.A. You know what time it is. She belongs to the streets. Literally. Let's keep going. Connolly took her client into Angel Alley, while Tabram guided hers into neighboring George Yard. It was the last time she saw Tabram alive. Barely two hours later, Constable Barrett had spoken to a soldier loitering near the north entrance of George Yard. The soldier had told Barrett that he was, quote, waiting for his mate who had gone away with a girl. Half an hour later, Tabram is presumed to have died. Both Connolly and Barrett were called upon to identify the soldiers, but all those accused could provide an alibi. One had been at home with his wife, another at an army base, and yet another in a completely different part of the city. This was enough for Inspector Edmund Reed, the lead investigator on the case, to abandon this line of inquiry. Connolly and Barrett, having both picked out the wrong men, they could not be trusted again, as their evidence would be worthless. Pause. Even if a and just so you guys know that um, the criminal investigation division had literally just reformed at this point. So, so you have, so think about it from this way, uh, but throw the camera on me real quick. So guys, think of it this way, right? Uh, you guys like my, my, uh, my swim trunks, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> so think of this, this is like the ultimate, like um, recipe of success for like a, a lunatic killer. You got a disgruntled and underpaid police force. You got a bunch of low morale officers walking the beats, uh, walking the beat in London. You have a lack of technology for forensic evidence or anything else that can go ahead and identify you from a conclusive standpoint. You have 
uh, criminal investigation division that was just newly incorporated that just got reformed. Like this was literally the breeding ground to create uh, a serial killer situation where that serial killer would not be captured. So um, yeah, that's why the legend of Jack the Ripper still stands to this day and they never found him. I think a big part of that is because they never caught him. So, uh, but he was operating at a time where it was his advantage. I mean, he had an even bigger advantage than people like, like Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, et cetera, who, you know, were able to enjoy the benefits of being able to kill people and not be traced with DNA until many years later. You have something, Kim, that you want to say? Yeah. So, um, another thing was due to him going after prostitutes, um, the police didn't really care. And even though it was very normal for there to be prostitutes everywhere, they would have to like sneak around. So go into these alleyways. So it was perfect for him to get away with the murder because there was no witnesses in those areas. Ah, uh, good point. Good point. Yeah. Cause they would like take them to a yeah. dark alley somewhere to do a quickie or whatever. So, they couldn't so see them. yeah, that want for privacy also ended up being their downfall. Exactly. I will say, I will say that was a trend that he created because if we can think about another killer that did the exact same thing or well, similar was the green river killer. Back then, also ah, he will yes. kill. He will kill uh, prostitutes, and the police really like didn't pay that much attention. If you know what I mean. Good point. Good point. Yeah, guys, go watch our Green River Killer um, episode, guys. He did the same exact thing uh, back in the seventies and the eighties, where he would also pick up prostitutes and mm -hmm. take them to secluded areas, and he would actually like hook up with them and pay them and kill them right after. So yeah. Um. So yeah, that's 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 yeah, that's a more modern day version. I mean, mm -hmm. the thing with him though is that he would have like this guy was. You guys are gonna see here. He was super violent, Jack the Ripper. Like a lot of uh, Green River Killer, all these other guys, they they just like choked them and shit, or they strangled them. But this guy was like on some real demon time with how he dealt with these chicks. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, but you know, a lot of serial killers strangle because it's like a very personal way to kill someone, which is weird. Ted Bundy used to do that. Jeffrey Dahmer used to do that. Samuel Little, uh, the Night Stalker, not so much. He he killed them through any means. He stabbed them. He shot them. He strangled them. He was, I guess, multi diversified. But most but, serial killers strangle their um, their victims. But, but uh, Jack oh. the Ripper exclusively pretty much was slashing them, even though he did strangle, I think, one of them and then slashed after. Yes, but I would argue that the main difference is that these serial killers that we mentioned, that we just mentioned, the, the modern ones are also rapists. So because of their rapists, they're also compulsive. So they will like tend to kill not as violent, uh, not as violent. Uh, What's the word? Some Violence. of them were necrophiliacs too, so they would go back to the body after the fact. Yeah. Like Ted Bunny used to do that shit. Green River Killer used to do that. So yeah. Yeah, but uh, Jack the Ripper was a serial killer, but he wasn't a rapist. Well, here's the thing: I don't know if they had uh, like rape kits back then to test DNA. Someone they, in they, the chat was they, like, he got his full refund back. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> oh my god! Y'all you know, no are you. fucking ruthless, man. <laughs> What the fuck? You guys have no chill. Yo, what the <laughs> fuck, bro? <laughs> Down the Monko, Monko. Yo, this chat got no <laughs> chill. I remember one of the funniest things I ever read uh, was um, people used to call um, the Netflix and yeah, kill? yeah, they used to I call Jeffrey it. Dahmer. He would bring the dudes over and he'd make them watch the fucking Exorcist too. And he used to be like, "Yeah, he's gonna Netflix and kill." <laughs> or, or, or uh, you think I was feeling you, nigga? You lunch? I was like, "What the fuck, bro?" <laughs> Like, you guys are hilarious in the chat, man. <laughs> you guys got some go to comments. And this is the thing. This is why this is the best true crime channel fucking on YouTube. Because y'all be saying the most inappropriate shit. And we just sit here and laugh about it. You know, we're not over here like, oh, my God, that's not appropriate. <laughs> like, nah, man, you guys are fucking ruthless. It's hilarious. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't. The thing is, like, we don't, I don't know if uh, Jack the Ripper was out here graping these chicks because they didn't have DNA back then. But who knows? Uh, yeah. Let's keep rolling the, the tape, though. But good point. Green River Killer is a functional equivalent when it comes to like put, bringing women to secluded areas. Yeah. Soldier had been responsible. No one could deduce a motive. The people of Whitechapel might have been accustomed to crime and violence, but the sheer brutality of this attack was as frightening as it was confounding. The crime is one of the most brutal that have occurred for some years. For a poor defenseless woman to be outraged and stabbed in such a manner is almost beyond belief. These were the concluding remarks delivered at the final inquest held on August the 23rd. Only a week later, things would go from bad to worse.
On the morning of August the 31st, a man named Robert Paul left his home on Foster Street and headed for work. After making a right turn into Bucks Row, he spotted a man standing in the road. The man turned around to face him and said, Come and look over here. There's a woman lying on the pavement. The stranger was named Charles Cross, and he too had been on his way to work when he first caught sight of the woman. The two men now cautiously approached. The woman's hands were cold to the touch, and Cross believed she was dead. Paul, however, thought he could sense faint breathing. But instead of seeking immediate help, Cross and Paul were more concerned about being late for work. As such, they quickly wow. resumed their morning wow, commute, boss. hoping... Can you imagine that? Like, oh, damn, yeah. man, like, I found a dead body. But, bro, my boss gonna write me up if I don't get there on time. Like, what the fuck, man? Um, but you also, the other thing, too, I want to let the people know. Guys, this is the late 1800s. Like, human life wasn't... How do I say this? It wasn't prized as much as it is now. And that, guys, you gotta remember, back then, disease was rife. This was a poor part of town. No one really care. Everyone's an immigrant. Everyone's out for themselves. Like there wasn't the same dedication to the preservation of life back then as there is now. Mortality rates where people were dying at a younger age because people didn't have access to clean water like that. A lot of people were alcoholics. A lot of these prostitutes that he killed were alcoholics um, because when you don't have money, right, the only thing that's really available abundantly is, is alcohol because they didn't have the technology to give you purified filtered water all the time. That's something that only the rich enjoyed. So there wasn't really a regard for human life to the same degree as today, as there was back then. Nobody gave a shit, man, because people died all the time because of disease, you know? Like, they literally were like, hey, yo, bro, people die every day, B. So that's kind of how they looked at it. Uh, so let's get back to it. To notify policemen along the way. Fortunately, Constable John Neal was just around the corner. Neal was equipped with a lantern and found the woman lying on her back with a deep cut across the throat. The wound was still bleeding and parts of her body were still warm. He was soon joined by Constable John Thane, who was sent at once to fetch a nearby doctor. Upon his arrival, shortly after four o'clock, Dr. Reese Llewellyn estimated that, quote, she had not been dead more than half an hour. In other words, Cross and Paul had likely found... Uh, this, is another, this is the one thing that I want to, like, why not? Um... What? How in the 1800s people would know, because there were no like the forensics, uh, the forensics uh, aspect of that is right now, that is now in this like modern era, it wasn't before. Now it didn't six, it, did, it didn't exist before. So how will they that determine that determine? Yeah, that she was dead. Like. What? One hour well, they're they're speculating. You know, they're doing the best that they can given the their you know technology and information back then. But, so that's that's you know, and and a lot of times you guys are gonna see here some of the doctors were actually not correct. Okay. You know, because well, I mean back then like they were like using like crazy like med like the, a lot of the, the way for them to solve a lot of problems back then was just amputation. Oh, your leg's broken. Let's just amputate it, bro. You'll be fine. You know what I mean? Like that's just that was really the extent of a lot of their uh, medical practices. And they checked for the warmth of her hands, and they checked for a pulse. So when her hand, when a body is really cold and there's no pulse, no response, it's most likely she's dead. Yeah, yeah it's, and been dead for a while. And been exactly. Mm -hmm. that, so but when they, but, but that I, I don't get how is this speculation because, um, I mean, how can they determine its exact? hour you know like they're time. estimating that's crazy. they're estimating okay well whatever okay. yeah and there's actually a huge conspiracy on the one of the witnesses um cross like huge do, do we, you want to talk about that when yeah, that person later, gets yeah. okay it's yeah. one of the on one of the, it's like the third or fourth victim right um it was the one that they just mentioned Oh, then, okay. But um, yeah, they're, they haven't revealed all the information, so I don't want to spoil it. Oh, okay, chat. okay. Yeah. So we'll, once it's done, then just tell us to pause yeah. and we'll go. Okay. All right, go ahead. Let's run the clip. On the woman, mere minutes after she was killed. Furthermore, three officers had patrolled the vicinity just a few minutes prior. Constable Neal had last inspected Box Row at approximately 3.15. So too had Sergeant Henry Kirby, whereas Constable Thane had merely passed the end of the street, none of whom had seen nor heard anything amiss. Upon the body's removal to the mortuary, a shocking discovery was made. 
Apart from two incisions in the throat, the woman had also been, quote, disemboweled. No organs had been removed, but Dr. Llewellyn found, quote, several incisions running across the abdomen. He also believed that the killer possessed, quote, some rough anatomical knowledge, for he seemed to have attacked all the vital parts. The victim was quickly identified. Her name was Marianne Nichols, and she had turned 43 just five days before the murder. Nichols had at least six children. 43 and she was a hooker. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. And her last known address was a common lodging house at 56 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Nichols had been turned away from a lodging house on Thrall Street as she lacked the funds to pay for a bed. Seeking to raise the money through prostitution, Nichols had then ventured down Osborne Street before meeting her friend, Ellen Holland. The two of them shared a brief exchange, but Nichols was visibly drunk. Pause. When they a bunch of his victims, by the way, you guys are going to catch here a trend, were super drunk when they were killed. And the other thing I want to say, too, because some of you guys are wondering, like, wait, hold on. What, what do you mean pay for a bed? So um, back then, guys, they had like these little lodging houses where you can pay for a bed for the night. And <clears throat> because so many people were poor, they would have to pay by the night versus, you know, paying rent or whatever it may be. So a lot of these women, what they would do is they, you know, obviously hook around for a bit get some money and then they'd go ahead and go to the, one of these lodging places and have the money to be able to sleep for nice. So it was a really rough time. And a lot of people lived in a very, very uh, poor state here. I mean, this was, this is where all the poorest and the worst of the worst uh, London had to offer lift in was lived was in this white chapel, East London area. So let's get back to it. Parted ways around half past two, Holland saw Nichols staggering eastward along Whitechapel road. Barely an hour later, she was found dead. Apart from the body itself, the killer had left nothing in their wake. No blood trail, no murder weapon, no witnesses. Inspector Joseph Helson, the lead investigator on the case, stated that, quote, not an atom of evidence can be obtained to connect any person with the crime. While the Nichols case ground to a screeching halt, its similarities with the Martha Tabram case had not gone unnoticed. In both cases, the attack had been needlessly ferocious, and there was no discernible motive. Both victims were prostitutes of roughly the same age and moved in the same circle. As the sun was rising on September the 8th, a man named John Richardson was on his way to work. At a quarter to five, he made a quick stop at 29 Hanbury Street. He went through the entrance and out the back door by way of a cramped hallway. Richardson then sat down on the backyard steps before grabbing a knife to trim a vexing piece of leather from his boot. Once satisfied, he left the building and shut the front door behind him. About an hour later, a third floor tenant of the same address, John Davis, plodded downstairs and into the hallway. The front door was now wide open, but the one in the back was closed. When Davis went to open it, he found the bloodied remains of a woman lying on her back just below the steps. So this is where shit's going to get a little bit weird, guys, with the leather apron, etc. Uh, so pay attention on this one. Let's get into it. Let's get back. Inspector Joseph Chandler was the first officer on the scene. After a brief inspection, he sent at once for a medic. Dr. George Phillips arrived at half past six and found the woman, quote, terribly mutilated. The throat had been, quote, dissevered deeply, whereas the abdomen had been, quote, entirely laid open. 
the intestines had been, quote, lifted out of the body and placed by the shoulder of the corpse. Pause. The- Bro, could you imagine that, guys? Like, yo, <laughs> take out someone's intestines and put them by their shoulder. This uh, individual obviously, like, he's not squeamish. Got, probably got a bunch of blood on him. And the fact that they took the time to do that tells you about their true evil, man. That is crazy. Yeah. So, wow. All right. That's why That's why this guy is so infamous, man. And yeah. they never caught him. Definitely on his demon time. Yeah, bro. What the hell? The body was then conveyed to the mortuary, while Inspector Chandler and Dr. Phillips conducted a sweep of the backyard. Most of what they found belonged to the tenants of the building. But just below the resting place of the woman's feet, they found a small piece of cloth and two combs. The items had likely belonged to the victim, but it seemed to Dr. Phillips that they had been deliberately positioned and arranged by the killer. Pause. So after you do all that crazy stuff, you take their intestines out and put it by their shoulder and slash them all up and all this other crazy shit, you go at him like, oh, hold on. How rude of me. Give me one second. Let me go ahead and place all your items neatly by your feet like what the fuck <laughs> uh, hey man like i said before like the, a lot of these serial killers guys they have um they have certain obsessions and they're and they're um how do i say this they're they're obsessed with doing things in a very routine systematic way which is why they a lot of times they carry out their killings in the same pattern or on the same demographic of victim and doing it in a certain way over a period of time. You know, we see this with many serial killers, whether it's Ted Bundy going after women that have dark hair, um, David Berkowitz, a.k.a. the son of Sam, shooting at women that have dark hair. Um, I mean, damn near he had New York City going crazy. Chicks were going to the salons, either making themselves blonde or cutting their hair all together because he went after women that had, had long hair. Jeffrey Dahmer preyed on uh, gay men in uh, Minneapolis. So, uh, or was it, no, excuse me, was it Milwaukee? Uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, but either way, you guys get the point is uh, that serial killers def- def- definitely have a type, right? John Wayne Gacy went after teenage boys. So they like to do things in a certain fashion and they don't want to break that trend a lot of the times. The only serial killer that I would say is like, that wasn't as like systematic like these guys was uh, the Night Stalker. He didn't give a shit. He used to break in people's houses and he would use tools in the house to actually kill them. So I think he got more of a thrill of breaking in and using tools around them to make things happen. I will say that uh, what you're saying right now is, Part of the, comp- the their compulsion because a lot of serial killers, I won't I won't I won't say like all of them, but like a bunch of them have OCD. So yes, that's, that's yes. one thing, and also that's that's a part of their compulsion as a, a psychopath. That's a term like they have to be very like they, they like to be very like organized and like don't leave trails and stuff because that's part of like their fucked up man, mind. Yeah, I will all say right. that. Let's get back to it. All right. The post-mortem revealed that two brass rings had been forcefully removed from the victim's left hand. These rings were nowhere to be found. Portions of the victim's abdomen had also gone missing, including the womb. Dr. Phillips believed that, quote, the mode in which these portions were extracted showed some anatomical knowledge. This point was greatly expanded upon at the subsequent inquest. The injuries had been made by someone who had considerable anatomical skill and knowledge. There were no meaningless cuts. For instance, no mere slaughterer of animals could have carried out these operations. It must have been someone accustomed to the post-mortem room. The victim was quickly identified as Annie Chapman. Chapman's date of birth is a bit uncertain, but she was roughly 47 at the time of her death. She had at least seven children, but was tragically only survived by two. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 35 Dorset Street. Pause. And this woman was a raging alcoholic, guys, that had really bad health. Um, she was already kind of at her wit's end uh, when she was killed. But, um, you know, not saying that she obviously deserves that, not saying that at all. But, yeah, she was, uh, you know, her alcoholism definitely played into her situation. So. With, with the babies and stuff? Uh, no, no, no. Like, like when she got this night that she was killed, she was extremely drunk. Oh, okay. Very, very, yeah, very drunk. And she was an alcoholic. A lot of prostitutes use that as like a coping mechanism. Absolutely. To not be aware of like what's going on and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, people might not like me saying this, but like this, when I used to, you know, 
strippers are like that too. Let's just keep it a thousand. Like a lot of them like drink or do drugs or whatever to like kind of get over the fact that they're being touched by strange individuals uh, at a nightclub. You know what I mean? It's it's not natural for a woman to offer herself physically to you know strange men all all around the night. So, but you know it is what it is. She belongs to the streets. Or in this case, since we're speaking about Victorian era England, thou belongest to the streets. <laughs> <laughs> On the night of her death, Chapman had been denied accommodations as she lacked the funds to pay for a bed. She was escorted off the premises by the night watchman, who then saw her vanish into a nearby alleyway. What happened to Chapman over the next few hours, nobody knows. Her whereabouts during this time is a complete mystery. But unlike the two previous cases, a witness in the Chapman case might have caught a glimpse of the killer. At half past five on the morning of September the 8th, a woman named Elizabeth Long spotted a man and a woman conversing outside 29 on Hanbury Street. Long was positive that the woman she'd seen was Annie Chapman, but the man had stood with his back towards Long, so she never saw his face. Long did, however, manage to overhear a fragment of their conversation. The man had posed the question, Will you? To which the woman responded, Yes. Now, a lasting point of contention in the Chapman case is the time of death. According to Dr. Phillips, when he arrived at 6.30, Chapman had been dead for, quote, at least two hours. That would place her death at around half past four. But according to Long, she saw Chapman alive a full hour later. Then there's the testimony of John Richardson. Richardson was the son of one of the tenants in the building. At a quarter to five, he made a routine checkup on the door to the basement, which had previously suffered a break-in. When he found it secure, he sat down on the backyard steps to trim a piece of leather from his boot. Even though he sat mere centimeters from the murder site, Richardson did not see a body. He was adamant on this point. I could not have failed to notice the deceased if she had been there. To muddle the timeline even further, there's the testimony of Albert Kadosh. About 20 minutes past five, Kadosh had gone through the backyard of 27 Hanbury Street when he heard voices coming from nearby. They were barely audible, however, and Kadosh had only made out the word, no. A few minutes later, he heard something falling against the wooden fence, dividing the two yards. There's no one way to untangle this web of contradictions, but Dr. Phillips did Pause. concede the possibility. Yeah, so you guys can see here four, uh, before 4.30 time of death, 4.45 empty backyard, four, 5.20 from witnesses, strange sounds, seen alive, 5.30. You know, it's possible that, you know, the doctor could have been wrong about how long she had been dead, or it's possible that the killer killed her somewhere else and brought the body there. But again, this is what ends up happening, guys, when you have limited, you have limited technology, you have uh, doctors that not, aren't necessarily, you know, as advanced as we are today, where you can actually pinpoint time of death to a more specific degree. This is what the police had during this time to go off of, man. So it was very difficult to solve murders uh, like this back then, which is why so many of them occurred uh, back in the day. So uh, let's go back. And then we'll read the chats here in a little bit, guys. They, by the way, uh, guys, real quick, I'm looking right now. We got, I think, 1,700 or plus you guys watching right now. Yeah. Do me a favor. Like the video, man. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, let's get the engagement up to almost 100% because uh, I know this video might get hit for violence. So go ahead and uh, like the video, man, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get back to it. That he'd miscalculated. That, quote, the coldness of the morning and the great loss of blood had skewed his opinion, which was largely based on the warmth of the body. So, presuming that Dr. Phillips did miscalculate and the recollections of Long and Kadash were off by a few minutes, that would place Chapman's death at around 5.30 in the morning. By this point, the dim light of dawn would have provided the tenants of 29 Hanbury Street an unobstructed view of the murder site, some of whom had even slept with their windows open. In spite of this, the killer managed to evade detection and even made time to arrange the victim's possessions. As the tally of victims gradually mounted, the public grew increasingly anxious. They were not only frightened by the murders, but frustrated with the police and their perceived incompetence. Even across the pond were the efforts of the police fiercely criticized. 
the London police and detective force is probably the stupidest in the world. What these mocking quotes and illustrations failed to capture were the overwhelming odds stacked in favor of the perpetrator. The police were up against someone who seemingly struck without motive, someone who left no murder weapon and few witnesses. On top of that, the East End was severely overcrowded while the police were understaffed. As one newspaper put it, a man in the East End of London is a grain of sand, as invisible and almost as much beyond identification amid the masses. At no point will this become more apparent than during the events of September the 30th. This one's about to get crazy. On September the 29th, a routine Saturday meeting was held at the Socialist Club on Burner Street. When the meeting came to a close around midnight, all but a few members returned home. Those who remained proceeded to drink and socialize. Half an hour in September the 30th, Joseph Lave stepped outside to get some fresh air. Lave used the side entrance leading into Dutville's yard and lingered for about 10 minutes. Moments after Lave had gone back inside, Morris Eagle accessed the building via the same entrance. He too was a member of the club and had just returned after escorting a woman home. Neither of them noticed anything unusual. 20 minutes later, the sound of a horse and carriage could be heard trotting down Burner Street. The driver was Louis Diemschutz, the steward of the clubhouse. When Diemschutz drove into Dutville's yard, his pony abruptly veered to the left. When he looked down to his right, he thought he could discern something in the darkness. Diemschutz stepped down from his barrow, and after lighting a match, could see a woman lying on her side against the wall. Without even knowing if she was, quote, drunk or dead, Diemschutz rushed inside the club to check on his wife. When he found her safe and sound, he alerted the other members, and a small crowd soon gathered outside. They could now see that the woman's throat had been, quote, fearfully cut, and that, quote, a stream of blood was trickling down the yard. Eagle, Diemschutz, and a few others promptly dispersed to find a policeman. While a growing crowd of bystanders waited for authorities to arrive, there was no sign of the perpetrator. But across the city, less than a kilometer to the west, an even more ghoulish discovery was about to be made. At half past one of the same morning, Constable Edward Watkins patrolled an open space known as Mitre Square. Watkins' beat would take him through the square about once every 13 minutes, and on this occasion, it was deserted. But in the time it took Watkins to complete another rotation, Mitre Square was turned into a crime scene. Boss. And I also want to let you guys know, this is pre, you know, cars like that. You know what I mean? Cars weren't really a thing yet. So these patrols were all done on foot. Okay, just so you guys know. I don't want you guys to think like, oh, yeah, is he like in a horse or a buggy or whatever? No, more than likely, uh, he's on foot doing these patrols. Oh, not even on carriage? I don't know. They're, they're full patrols. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> Things were different back then, man. <laughs> yeah, there's no 911 and them going lights and sirens. The best you're going to get is them maybe running. But like, so. how will they get there in a certain time? That's just crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's because because they're always circling around. So you would basically be at the mercy of like looking around and see if you could see one. Right. Wow. Yelling help or some shit. Yeah, times were different back then. <laughs> Yelling for help. <laughs> I next came in at one forty-four. I turned to the right. I saw the body of a woman lying there on her back. I saw her throat was cut and her bowels protruding. The stomach was ripped up. She was lying in a pool of blood. Dr. George Zikera and Dr. Frederick Brown soon converged upon the scene. They found terrible injuries inflicted upon the woman's face, throat, and abdomen. The intestines had been, quote, drawn out to a large extent and placed over the right shoulder. Among the many lacerations to the face, Dr. Brown noted that, quote, the lobe and oracle of the right ear was cut obliquely through. Based on their expert opinions, coupled with the testimony of Watkins, the woman had died within minutes of her body being found.
back in Burner Street, Dr. Frederick Blackwell and Dr. George Phillips had reached the same conclusion. The woman in Dutville's yard had died within minutes of her body being found. But unlike previous victims, she had only suffered injuries to the throat. There were no abdominal mutilations or anything else by which to connect the attack to the others. But the murder in Dutville's yard and the one in Mitre Square were separated by less than one kilometer and some 45 minutes. This allowed for a chilling possibility. It was suspected then, as it continues to be today, that when Diemschutz came clattering through the gateway, he unwittingly interrupted the murder. The killer may even have become trapped inside Dutville's yard because the gate on Burner Street was the only point of entry. Perhaps they saw an opportunity to escape when Diemschutz then rushed inside the club. From there, it would have taken them less than 15 minutes to reach Mitre Square. Plenty of time to hunt for another victim. Damn, pause. But it must... So, this is where, you know, you can go ahead and put your tinfoil hats on. Was there more than one murderer? Were they working as a team? Did he purposely kill a second person on that night to go ahead and divert attention from the murder in Duckfield's yard? So, um, and this is the first and last time that he had killed two people on the same night, guys. So... You know, there's a bunch of different theories here, um, but yeah, crazy shit. Let's keep going. That dude was a uh, that dude fucking sprinted to do another kill. <laughs> we emphasize that this is pure speculation. There is no evidence to suggest the two murders were even connected. The woman in Dutville's yard was identified as 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride. Stride was a Swedish immigrant who'd lived in London for over two decades. Following the death of her husband, she had made a living through prostitution. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street. Uh, this kind of makes me wonder, um, what yeah. other type of, wor of works, jobs, will women have in the 1800s? Because they were all prostitutes, apparently. Yeah, and I they mean... They were all pretty old and had a lot of kids, so I'm guessing it was out of, like really bad necessity because they're all in their 40s almost yeah. 50s with like seven yeah this was kids. the poorest part of of london too ladies you got to keep that in mind and those this was like filled with like immigrants from you know jewish immigrants uh, irish immigrants uh just poor british people in general so yeah they were making money by any means and then in some situations here they would have husbands and the husband okay with them selling their bodies because it was the only way they would make money yeah but back then wouldn't they be like supported by their husbands mostly should be so, but a lot of them were poor and couldn't find work okay and a lot of them also keep in mind a lot of them uh were illiterate too they couldn't read or write so oh, okay yeah so they wouldn't have like, but what, what kind of like jobs would they have back then like the women like, I uh, mean, what else could they do because besides being on the streets yeah i don't know making a sandwich <laughs> so let's get back to it <laughs> On the night of her death, Stride Pause. had been seen by... I, I just got to... Someone... You guys are clowns. Someone sent me a message. Someone put in the chat, uh, Jack, the refund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bro, what the fuck, Maybe man? Say, like, you guys are hilarious. Yeah, yeah, there's no chill, man. All right, let's keep going. Jack Quite an abundance of witnesses. First, she was seen in the company of a, quote, respectably dressed man around 11 o'clock. About a quarter to midnight, Stride was seen talking to a man who was, quote, decently dressed and had the appearance of a clerk. Then, only a few minutes before the murder, Stride was seen in the company of a man by Constable William Smith. The man was carrying a small parcel wrapped in newspaper and was of, quote, respectable appearance. It's unclear whether these descriptions are of the same person or if Stride accosted multiple clients as the night progressed. There were other witnesses, some less credible than others, but the one that really stood out from the rest was Israel Schwartz. Oh. About a quarter to one, Schwartz had been walking down Burner Street. As he came up on Dutville's yard, he witnessed a man throwing a woman to the ground in front of the entrance. The woman had, quote, screamed three times, but not very loudly. Schwartz would later identify this woman as Elizabeth Stride. Schwartz did not try to intervene, but opted instead to simply cross the street. Wow. That's when he spied a second man on the opposite side who was lighting a pipe. The man who attacked the woman then appeared to address the second Pause. man by... 
the reason also, guys, just so you know, the reason why so many you guys notice like there's a trend here where um, witnesses don't really want to get involved or they don't like really get um, they don't take overt steps to stop things from happening is because there was so much crime back then, guys, and so much BS going around. It was so common for them to see this fights on the street, people being robbed, people being mugged, people being attacked, etc. cetera, that didn't want to bring any attention or bring any of these this violence back on them since it was so strong with animosity back then. You got a bunch of immigrants that are all poor, can't read, can't write, coming from living in, in literally 20 to 30 people crammed in a room. Like, it was a terrible time. So people kept to their own business. Like, those guys that saw the body, damn, I'm going to be late for work, you know, because making money to feed their family was more important than, like, potentially being late and losing their job. So, uh, it was very cutthroat era, guys. It was a very cutthroat era, very difficult time. Um, you know, we have so many modern conveniences now that we enjoy that we will never understand what it was like to live uh, yeah. in, in that time or in that era. So, Shouting the name Lipsky. The pipe smoker then proceeded to follow Schwartz before eventually breaking away. When taken at face value, this story appears to suggest that the killer had an accomplice, an accomplice by the name of Lipsky. This was indeed the interpretation of some government officials. But Inspector Frederick Abeline, one of the lead investigators on the case, had a very different interpretation. You see, the name Lipsky had gained notoriety in 1887 when a Jewish man by the name of Israel Lipsky was convicted of murder. Owing to the publicity of that case, the surname Lipsky had become an anti-Semitic slur. Abeline therefore deduced that the man who shouted Lipsky was directing an insult at Schwartz, who was described as having a quote, strong Jewish appearance. The man with a pipe, meanwhile, may have been an innocent passerby who became frightened along with Schwartz. Whether Abeline's interpretation is correct, it's doubtful we'll ever truly know. Nevertheless, Schwartz's account is compelling as he conceivably witnessed the moment when Elizabeth Stride was attacked. Back in Mitre Square, a large crowd of spectators had ascended upon the scene, all driven by their morbid curiosity to get a glimpse of the body. The post-mortem revealed that the killer had extracted a few organs, including the womb and left kidney. According to Dr. Brown, this extraction required, quote, a good deal of knowledge which he likened to that of a butcher. By contrast, Dr. Siqueira did not find any signs of, quote, great anatomical skill. The woman in Mitre Square was identified as 46-year-old Catherine Eddowes. Eddowes had at least five children, but after escaping her abusive husband, she had become estranged from her family. Her last known address was a common lodging house at 55 Flower and Dean Street. On the night of her death, Eddos had been out drinking. She got so drunk that you guys see a little trend here. He's he's uh he's attacking women that are drunk as hell, and it's at night when no one is seeing what's going on here. So, yeah, he's Jack the Ripper out here uh, is going after the women boozing. But even though um, it's crazy to me, oh, uh, you're not talking to the mic, Angie. They can't hear you. Uh, it's crazy to me that nobody saw a man covered in blood because this guy was taking out instances from people yeah and that, that's ears, a good point yeah like throat so he must have been like completely covering blood yeah i mean to for to take like i don't i wouldn't know but like to take out instances from a body you you must be like you know like, be covering in blood i guess yeah so, yeah that's I that's mean, a fair point like i mean um and one of the one of the murder scenes he had there was a leather apron that had blood on it but um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy how, uh, they weren't able to find this guy because whoever did it, there's no way they could have done it without, you know, Being cleanly. Seen as well. Yeah. Like, like there is a lot of people in the streets. Like how? Yeah. Another thing was there was a time where he was witness or quote unquote seen and he was seen with like a black robe and it was like so dark out at night that they wouldn't be able to see the blood uh, and on like on black, you can't see like red stains. Yeah. So. Yeah. They, yeah. He committed these murders. If you guys noticed, it was always either super late at night or early, early morning hours before the sun was out. And you guys got to remember this is Victorian uh, era, yeah. England. Yeah. There's no, there, you know, you might see one street light every couple of, you know, blocks if that you but know even yet on the street, you will see like the steps, like, uh, like the, the blood, he will step on the blood or something like anything, anything. It's and we're talking about a lot of blood here. Yeah, it's just crazy. But yep. anyways, mm -hmm. it's crazy he was able to get away. But yeah, yeah. 
at around half past eight, she was found lying on the sidewalk in Aldgate High Street, surrounded by a crowd. The commotion attracted a few officers, who then escorted Eddowes to a nearby police station. There, she remained locked in a cell until one o'clock in the morning. After being released from jail, Eddowes was likely spotted in the company of a man in the vicinity of Mitre Square. Only one of the three witnesses, Joseph Lavenda, had paid close attention to the couple. The man had the appearance of a sailor and wore a, quote, reddish handkerchief round his neck. While Lavenda did identify the woman as Catherine Eddowes, he never saw her face. Nevertheless, this sighting was only made some 10 minutes before Edo's body was discovered by Constable Watkins. What's so incredibly tragic about the Edo's case is how narrowly the killer escaped justice. First of all, the only private residence in Mitre Square was occupied by a policeman and his family. Ow. They had slept right next to an upper floor window overlooking the murder site. Second of all, a night watchman and retired policeman had been cleaning a warehouse within earshot of the murder site. He would routinely hear the footsteps of patrolling officers, yet heard nothing at the time of the murder. Finally, Constable James Harvey had glanced into Mitre Square at roughly 20 minutes to two. That's right in between the sighting by Lavenda and the body's discovery. Harvey should have had an unobstructed view of the murder site yet he failed to notice anything suspicious. Was it too dark? No, this is, no, this is people helping each other or something to hide something here. You think so? Yeah, of course. It could be a conspiracy. It could be just poor police work, incompetence. No. You know, I mean, even the people back then criticized the police for being incompetent. And, yes. you know, the morale was a little like we discussed before. Yes, that's so. true. There will be like articles in the newspapers and stuff about the, the, the policemen being un like, yeah, incompetent. But even though, we're talking about five killings here. That's crazy. There are too many witnesses. Like there, That's people hiding something. Definitely. Was the killer standing just a few meters away, cloaked in shadow? Did one or more witnesses get the time wrong? While the killer did ultimately escape, they did not do so without leaving a trace. Shortly before three o'clock, a bloodstained piece of cloth was found near the entrance to a building a few blocks to the northeast. Oh it proved to be a ripped portion of the apron worn by Eddowes. The patch had evidently been torn off and then discarded by the killer upon their escape. Now on the wall above this patch of apron, someone had written a message. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Pause. Oh, the boys. What, what the hell, bro? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, here we go. Here we go! <laughs> to this day, both the meaning and the author of this message remain in doubt. Was it written by the killer? Was it an attempt to cast suspicion upon or even away from the Jewish community? Was it completely unrelated to the murder? Similar questions would soon be raised by a few letters. Letters which had supposedly been written and posted by the killer. Pause. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, see the birth of Jack the Ripper. Because at this point, guys, these are just a bunch of crazy murders where someone is going ahead and pulling out intestines, etc. The police had zero to, you know, little to zero clues. So finally... You know, at this point, the, the you know, the killer feels confident, feels like the police don't got anything. Let's go ahead and taunt them that, a little bit with letters. I mean, look at the trend here with the with the letters. The Zodiac Killer, David Bartolis. Bring the mic closer to you. The the trend, I'm talking about the trend that this this killer will set. I, will, I don't know if there were, like, before there were other killers that will, like, send police, uh, send, send notes to the police. But, like, look at David Berkowitz. Uh, the Soldier Killer. This is too similar to the Soldier Killer if you think about it. Yeah, this is probably the first person to do it that was like big. Yeah. Well. But you see, you saw a couple other people follow in his footsteps with you know sending the press letters, taunting them, and yeah. taking you know claim for the murders. I mean, what's what's going 
through their minds to send like notes taunting the police. It's they want clout, like... bro. They do anything for clout, man. <laughs> they do anything for clout. Even the late 19th century, they want some clout. God damn it. Let's, let's run it the clip. Three days before the murder of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, the Central News Agency of London received a letter in the post, the author of which claimed responsibility for the recent murders and to be planning for the, quote, next job. Then, in the aftermath of the two killings, the same agency received a hey, blood-smeared postcard. Can you rewind it real quick, Angie? And to be planning for oh, posts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go, go, okay, keep going. The author of which claimed responsibility for the recent murders and to be planning for the cause. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Haha. Ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? What the fuck, bro? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Next job. September 25th, 1888. Then, in the aftermath of the two killings, the same agency received a blood smeared postcard. Wow. It contained details about the atrocities, which the author described as a quote, double event. Pause. And it reads, I was not cutting dear old boss when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit. Couldn't finish straight off. God damn, this dude needs some help writing. Uh, <laughs> had not time to get ears off for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I get I got to work again. So as you guys can see here, he's not a good writer. You know, literacy wasn't really a big thing back then. It wasn't prioritized. You know, just like his comment about, you know, them boys on the wall. Uh, what? More than likely came from the same person because of the, I guess, strange writing style that doesn't make sense. But let's keep going. On the off chance that the letters were genuine, the police decided to make them public. The hope was that someone would recognize the handwriting. Unfortunately, no one ever did. Instead, it merely served to advertise the name with which the letters had been signed. Opinions on the letter's authenticity were divided back then and continue to be today. Most notably, the Dear Boss letter had promised to quote, clip the lady's ears off and send them to the police. The police never received such a package and neither of the two victims had had their ears removed. But you may recall that the right earlobe of Eddowes had been quote, cut obliquely through. Was this a botched attempt by the killer to keep their promise? Or was it merely one of numerous lacerations with no connection to the letter? The contents of the letters notwithstanding, modern linguistic analysis does suggest that they were penned by the same hand. So, hoaxes or not, the authors were likely one and the same. However, the handwriting bore, quote, no resemblance at all to the message written above the torn patch of apron. Pause. Now, the pump. Well... I mean, that, that though you could make that argument, writing with a pen, right? Your handwriting isn't going to be the same as writing with chalk on a wall, right? Yeah. So that, that I mean, but then again, remember, guys, right? They have limited technology. Uh, but, what, but back then, there were, there were pens, right? It was like a... Uh, like, like, yeah, a like ink. feather with ink yeah. and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, <laughs> on that olden times thing. Exactly. But, but yeah, um, I think, if anything, the thing that links them more together is that... Uh, the weird writing style and not necessarily making sense and speaking in unclearly. Yeah. I think that's what kind of links it. <laughs> My man, blame them boys. The... <laughs> you blame them boys. Excuse Letters me. inspired an onslaught of copycats. Agencies all over London were soon inundated with correspondents imitating the other two. But at least one of them might have been genuine. Not because of the contents of the letter, but rather the content. What can we read in there? Oh, I, I can't. I can't make out any of that. Yeah. ...of a box with which it was delivered. On October the 16th, a man named George Lusk received a small package in the post. Lusk was the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, a small group of local tradesmen who sought to identify the killer. The package consisted of a letter and a cardboard box containing half a kidney. What the f The doctors who examined the kidney all agreed that it was human. But whether it was the same left kidney removed from the body of Edos could not be determined. Pause. See, guys, that would have been a big clue, right, if you got that in today's day and age because you would have been able to tie that kidney back to the victim through DNA. But back then, they couldn't do that. They didn't have any of that technology to be able to tie it back to one of the victims that were already killed, man. So these guys were significantly 
incapacitated when it came to solving crimes of this nature because they simply didn't have the technology, the expertise, and the skill set to be able to link the murders effectively through um, DNA or blood type, etc. Another thing is yeah. um, when I was looking into it in the letter, um, we can't read it here, but when I was looking into it, it said that in the letter, he talked about how he ate some of the organs, like he fried them and ate mm -hmm. them, and he sent them a piece back so they could have some. Wow. Pure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as y'all can see, this is a guy that doesn't have all his marbles there. So, oh, man. All right, let's get back to it. It could, for instance, have been an elaborate hoax by a medical student or someone with access to human organs. The author of the accompanying letter, meanwhile, insisted that the kidney... Oh, there yeah, this is, this is probably what you read. Um, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman. Paris served it for preserved. you. I think he means to say preserved, yeah. Uh, you, the other piece I fried and I and ate, it was very nice. He spelled <laughs> nice, N-I-S-E, hilarious. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Wow. October 15th, 1888. This dude <laughs> did belong to the victim and that they had fried and eaten the other half. A popular theory at the time, and one that still is today, was that some of the letters had been fabricated by the press. According to Chief Inspector John Littlechild, the letters were, quote, a smart piece of journalistic work. Assistant Commissioner Robert Anderson dismissed the letters as, quote, Yo, you guys are fucking hilarious. They, they said, uh, did Fresh write this letter? <laughs> <laughs> Yo. The right. creation of an enterprising London journalist. Meanwhile, Chief Constable Melville McNaughton thought he could discern the, quote, stained forefinger of the journalist. There are a few candidates for who this journalist might have been, but there is no solid evidence against any one of them. Whether it was a hoax by an enterprising journalist or the genuine prose of the Ripper, the letters did nonetheless receive widespread attention. They commanded space in virtually every newspaper and dominated much of the public discourse throughout October, a month which passed Pause. without a single atrocity. So just so you guys can see, this maps out all the murders. So you got um, the first one, which was August 7th, Martha Tabram. Then you got uh, approximately, you know, three weeks later, Marianne Nichols, August 31st. Then you got um, Annie Chapman, um, September 8th. And then you got Catherine Eddowes, yeah, September 30th. And then you got Elizabeth Stride also on September 30th. So he's killing every three weeks, it looks like, um, in the fall slash summer of uh, 1888. Yeah. And, and women that look like, like a lot, like they have the same yeah, age. Yeah, prostitutes. I, I, yeah, they have dark hair, prostitutes, alcoholics, walking the streets late at night. Yeah. So definitely uh, opportunist type serial killer here. City bearing the signature marks of Jack the Ripper. All of them violently Perhaps killed with knives. It was finally over. It is pretty certain that the monster has become frightened and has suspended his horrible work for the present if not for good. All right, pause. Let's take a super chat break real fast. Okay. Uh, thank you guys so much for the support. I'm looking right now. We got uh, about 1,800 of y'all watching. Uh, do me a solid, guys. Like the video. I see that we got um, 1.1k <laughs> 1. 1 uh, likes. Can we go ahead and get us up to uh, 1.8, guys? Let's get let's get let's get almost 100% engagement. Uh, uh, all right. So, um, okay. Um, and, and Kim, can you read them? Because I can't see them on my screen. Uh, Kim doesn't want to read them. I can read them. Um, <laughs> no, hell no. You 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 saw uh, Kim. Okay. You read them. <laughs> they don't understand you, Angie. Sorry. Myron, have you heard about the Daniel Morgan case? Put he, the camera on her. He was a London private investigator killed by an axe in the 80s. The case is still unsolved and is surrounded in the Metropolitan no, I never heard of it. Police Corruption. No, I never heard. Since you love Nick Fuentes so much, will you ever consider bringing Dr. Um Omar since you claim to be, quote unquote, fair? Yeah, this is the same <laughs> guy that complained about the racism before, I think, right? It, I think so. Yeah. 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 If, Sure, why not? I mean, like I said before, I, <laughs> hey man, I'm I'm totally cool with bringing people on that have different opinions on uh, how I look at things. But 
But yeah, my thing is this. Yeah, it, it's crazy how people will platform someone like Dr. Umar, right? Who is super pro black. Cool, no problem. But if Nick says something like, yeah, well, I'm super pro white, is pro white, you know, I, I I don't believe in race mixing, just like Dr. Omar says he doesn't believe in race mixing either. He says black men should marry black women. Nick says the same exact thing. White men should marry white women. They're like, oh, you're a white supremacist. But it's like they look at him with the negative connotation, but they don't give that same energy to Dr. Umar. That's what I'm saying. Like the problem a lot of the times is that it's okay when black people are racist, but they complain when other people are also practice the same racism that they practice. Like you see the fucking hypocrisy here. It's like they look at it like, oh, only Caucasians can be racist. And I look at that as a crazy, that's ridiculous. So it is what it is, man. But critical thinking is not something that the left likes to uh, <laughs> take into account. They want to go ahead and take the victim mindset every time. What's up next? Saludos al Myron de parte de Rosa Milano. They're just <laughs> saying hi. Okay, fair um, enough. What else? Hi, that was funny. Big fan of the channel. First time showing support. You should definitely cover Rosalio Reta. He's a kid. Sicario from Nuevo Laredo. Wicked story. Yes, I think I've heard of that case before. If I'm not mistaken, he's the guy with the tattoos all over his face. I think I, I think I know what you're talking about. Wow. Yeah, he goes. Joe, uh, shout out to you, Joe. Um, that's 100 PLN. I don't know what currency that is. Uh, but I think it's twenty dollars US. But either way, regardless, oh, he, we appreciate the support, my friend. He says <laughs> huge W for your for you, Myron. Golden job with a us a and anus and no. bitch. Okay, I fight, <laughs> I fight they viewers, but they are window lickers. Fire. I think they meant lickers. Okay. Since window liquor, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. All those do clip edits and giggle. Fuck them. Great show with Sauce Boy W Zerko. Mo, Walter, and Chris is a bum. Yeah, he, he said he fights their viewers because they're a bunch of window lickers. Yeah, bro, like, it's crazy to me how, like, their fans don't see through the bullshit. Like, we, we did, when we did our roast, right, as y'all know, it was, like, two hours long. I spent the first, like, hour plus just straight debunking, like, all the allegations they made on us. Then I took, like, the last part, and we just made fun of them and impersonated them, etc. And they took that part... And they focused on that versus us debunking all their lies. And their dumbass fans actually bought it hook, line, and sinker. So, and a lot of y'all are like, yo, but why? You just, all you had to do was debunk their statements and like you didn't have to go ahead and make fun of them. You guys got to understand that it doesn't matter what I do. Their fans are always going to support their fuckery. <laughs> you understand? It doesn't matter. So I looked at it like I'm going to debunk their shit for the high IQ people. And then I'm also going to give them some entertainment. But, you know, their fans are never going to change or come over to our side a lot of times, guys. Some guys do. Some guys see the light and they're like, damn, I'm not getting no fucking uh, value from these dudes. But most of the time, it's they're going to, they're going to, you know, they're not going to wa watch a two hour long broadcast and watch me like systematically debunk it, man. You guys got to remember a lot of their fans are stupid. So stupid. what's up next? But thank you so much for supporting my friend. Um, Them boys, CIA, $2. I and appreciate that, my friend. <laughs> Um, Roy Demio and the Demio crew, the Iceman Whack 200. You got to read the name first, Kim. Oh, TRC, TRC 23, 23 Manitoba, Winnipeg. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Roy Demio and the Demio crew, the Iceman whacked 250 people for, for the Cabino family and joined the forces with the Westies, Jimmy Conan. That's not true. Yeah, that's not true. We talked about this with uh, with Michael Francis, he debunked that, guys. So uh, watch that episode that I did with Michael Francis last week. We did an interview with him, and he talked about the Iceman and Roy DeMeo in detail. So uh, I have a timestamp on that. But, yeah, they definitely didn't kill 200 people. Yeah. That, was, that was overinflated for Hollywood. The reason that why we are not – because I, if you guys keep asking to do the Iceman and uh, this guy, Richard Kulinski, Kulinski uh, is because m many of the stuff that he did is not true. So, yeah, it's not verified. Yeah. Like he he overinflated his numbers to create a little bit more infamy for himself, guys. So that's kind of why I don't cover the Iceman Kuklinski because a lot of the accounts are over sensationalized for Hollywood dramatic effect. Mm -hmm. And Michael Francis confirmed that. And I'm going to take Mike's word over, you know, that dude. All right. Uh, Darnell, $5. Some of the Jack the Ripper letters may have been forgeries. True. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people. And that happened with the Zodiac Killer, too, where like a bunch of fakes came in and tried to take credit. TRC23 again. Um, Read Murder Machine and the Iceman. Man, y'all really want Kuklinski, yeah, bro. Yeah, they want All it. All right, let's keep going. Them boys, 999. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yo, <laughs> Yo, Yo man. <laughs> just now tuning in, guys. Just wanted to let you know my penny pinching self went on the FNF website yesterday to get merch, and the site is down. Any updates? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me. Sorry, I forgot. Okay. He told me that the site is down for the merch. So, but like all of them, all the links are, are down, and I checked it already, and yeah, they're down. So okay. we need to check that out. All right, I'll uh, I'll get in there uh, tonight after the show. Thank you for letting me know, uh, them boys, Byron, and I appreciate that you were willing to uh, spend some shekels with us. Appreciate nice. that, my friend. Yeah. Yo, yeah, yo, we really do got the best fucking chat in the world. Man. The monkey, you guys don't monkey. give a fuck, man. I love it. <laughs> Jonathan, 1999. Myron, can you please do the documentary JFK, The Smoking Gun, 2013? It talks about how the follow-up car containing the Secret Service agent George Hickey um, accidentally shot JFK with the fatal headshot using an AR-15. Okay, so don't worry. We're going to cover JFK in excruciating detail with Ryan Dawson. Yeah. So don't don't worry. JFK is absolutely coming, guys. JFK is coming. The war in Iraq is coming. Uh, we're going to cover... Um, uh obviously we're going to finish up 9 11 like a bunch of the conspiracy theories that you guys have we're going to cover those with um with ryan dawson don't worry okay daniel 1999 hi myron i'm 15 years old i've saved up 10k working under the table pause sorry irs oh, <laughs> taking boy. in all your advice thank you mr gain saving up for a pink volkswagen boogie i think that's a volkswagen boogie no? yeah volkswagen boogie yeah, yeah can't wait to go to mcdonald's to order one double mc Hamburger. Uh, Fuck yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. The fact that you knew all those details, oh you, really, you really be fucking with us, man. Yeah, he knew all the details. You knew all the details. <laughs> Shout out to you, bro. Shout That's out to so you, cool. man. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, no Matrix, $20. Angie, the best documentary on YouTube for Boys on the Tracks murder case is called Obstruction of Justice. The Mena connection. Can you write that down, yes, Angie? Yes. The case gets crazier the more you look into it. Thanks for all the things you guys do. Absolutely, man. We got y'all. And guys, do me a favor. There's 1.9K of you guys watching. Can you guys like the video? Let's get up to 1.8K likes. Let's get to almost 100% engagement. It really helps. Uh, Darnell, $20. Mr. Gaines, woman couldn't work back then. Those Thus, prostitution was one of the very few ways a woman could support herself. Back then, women didn't have rights. Some places, they couldn't drink or smoke cigarettes in public. All right, fair enough. Uh, th this well, is right. England, so well, they different times. Answer my questions that I asked before. Yeah. Um, J Soul Life, bro killing and misspelling. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. <laughs> What the hell, man? Uh, SLKXM Joker, let's go. FNF up. Super Chat won't let me roast them. Other sus boys. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably, um, it's fine. We, we we know who you guys are referring to when you say anus and reach or hobo and screech and lava and leech or, you know. Yeah, we have so many nicknames for these fucking guys, bro, so don't worry. Donkey Kong twins. <laughs> twin snakes. So. What's up next? Anything else? Oh, uh, yeah. House. Big Mo says. Oh, shit. Jack Shout out to Big Mo in the fucking house. <laughs> Jack the Ripper writes the same way Chris talks after Kim makes her fifth cup of 99% tequila and 0.8% orange. Yo! <laughs> it's, it's this much tequila. Yeah, put the camera on Kim so she it's sees. This much tequila and this much orange. Jeez. Bro. When is it tequila or the, or the henny? No, it's tequila now. Oh, he, he drinks tequila now. Yep. He stopped with the henny. Yeah. Yo, so. And he likes the see, way I make them. sitting right next to. He, he's sitting where Kim is sitting, and then obviously Chris is sitting where Angie's sitting. So he sees everything going on, and you know when the girls are in the back, Kim makes the drinks typically for for Chris, and yeah, like. It, <laughs> he likes the way I make them because every like after the third drink, I put like a little bit more tequila every time. So by the end of the show, he's he's feeling amazing. Yo, he said Jack the Ripper writes the same way Chris talks. <laughs> Yo, that's funny as fuck. All right, what's what's up next? Um, if y'all watch the after hour show, you guys know what I'm talking about. Three diglets, Angie. Why did you say this was a boring document? This is lit, man. No, 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 no. You got me wrong right there. Three, three diglets. Uh, I didn't say this was a boring document. Actually, I've also I also found it. My Martin have found it before, but I send it. I send it his his way again. I really like this documentary. It's really good. It's really well done. You all can see it. The thing that I don't that I find boring is the whole case of Jack the Ripper because as you can see, 
they didn't catch him because of like lack of technology back then like it's just boring it's just five killings and the guy just the, the only interesting thing is what the way he killed but that's there are like way more interesting cases you know that's all i'm saying Anyways, all right. Well, that's our opinion. And no Martin, and the worst part, the woman haven't gotten any better in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Misogyny. Um, can't wait to see Zircon Fed reacts. I don't mean as a guest. Pause. What? Right. Okay. Okay, I don't know. Okay, Big fair enough. Chunga says, "Keep up the motivation. Learned a lot. When? When are you going to? When are we going to see Rumble, Myron? Uh, I, 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 I go crazy on sneak." streams a lot of the times guys um, <laughs> he really does. yeah he goes i go crazy, crazy. on, on seco streams but um we'll we'll you guys will see us uh you know being on rumble a bit more and doing crazier shit on there as well you know what i mean um it's just that you guys got to remember that we got to balance it because we're both we're on rumble and youtube and um it's a it's a tricky game because you know but we still y'all be getting like 80 percent of the stuff but once we start going on rumble more we're just ironing some things out um, you guys are gonna see some craziness. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Rob says, "Myron, you need to get my Matt Walsh on. Have you seen his movie?" Uh, yes. What is a woman? I've never seen What Is a Woman, but I did see Candace Owens' documentary on uh, um, George Floyd. I watched the uh, What Is a Woman, but here's the thing, bro. And and I I accept this if this is the case, but we scare a lot of trad cons away, guys. You know, uh, all those guys from Daily Wire. Um, Though I agree with a lot of their points, you know, the nuclear family is the way to go, um, conservative mindset, I agree with most of their points. The only thing I don't agree with them on is acclimating to the current sexual marketplace, which they're not necessarily um, aware of. Uh, if you guys want, those are, uh, um, you guys should really check out the podcast that I did with Value Tainment. Uh, I went around the table and I asked all the girls, what do you think the average body count is of a woman that's 25 years old? And all the girls gave varying numbers, but... To sum it up for you, we had 20 girls on the panel. The average was about 20 to 25 girls. Crazy. Right? Disgusting. It, yeah. STDs. Yeah, 20 to 25 girls was the average number that all the girls estimated that the average 25-year-old woman would have by the time she's of that age. Then I pretty much was like, okay, if that's the case, then do you want a guy that has more or less sexual experience than you? All the girls agreed that women prefer a man that has more sexual experience than them. And then I was like, okay, that's exactly why you should have 50 bodies as a fucking dude. Right? <laughs> Down, but, go, but the thing is, go, is that, you know, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Candace Owens, etc. They would never agree with that um, with that strategy because to them, they look at it like, oh, you need to use like be religious, find a religious woman, you know, have a family, be married under the eyes of God, which that all sounds great. But that's not the world that we live in anymore, guys, like guys that rely on religion to find a good, dutiful wife. It ain't going to work anymore. You know, maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. But you got to adapt to the new sexual marketplace, man. Most people are not religious and you no longer have those training wheels to, to rely on. So that's one of the biggest differences between us and the trad con community or traditional conservative community, though I agree with their points. And I think the nuclear family is important. And I think that um, you need to raise children in two parent households. It's a very difficult proposition for men to get into that. And I think that they need to have the sexual experience to be able to figure out which woman can actually provide that to them. Women don't come pre-assembled like they used to be, guys. But hey, this is Fed Reacts. I don't want to make this a, a talk on, on dating and relationships like before. But uh, that's why so many trad cons have an issue with us. So I'll try to get Matt Walsh on for y'all. But don't hold your breath, man. A lot of trad cons are not, don't uh, agree with some of our points when it comes to contemporary modern dating. Uh, the fans was dropped as a kid. They fans. Yeah, facts. Their fans are fucking stupid. <laughs> Lack critical thinking skills. Uh, Kim, you got it because I can't see for more. Um, him again says leech dreads smell like dirty sink water. <laughs> uh -huh. Facts. Yeah. Facts. He he looks like he's stink from the camera. R <laughs> R M L says hi, Myron. You're a G. You're really helping, man. God bless. Thank you, you my friend. We're trying. Um. That's it. We have this one and one more. Oh. King Life said, "Did you say dance? Did you say dance?" dance? Just yeah, man, that okay. shit is funny as fuck, man. Um, Slim, Slim Joker goes, yeah. have y'all ever thought about having Rob Banks on the show? He a Florida rapper. I think he cool with Ronnie J. Nah, bro. No more rappers, bro. No, 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 <laughs> no. I, I nope. uh, like we're not bringing a rapper on, guys, unless like they're damn near A-list or yeah, like 
unfortunately, because no offense, and this doesn't go for all musicians, but musicians give some of the worst interviews, bro. They're constantly high. They bring their entourage on. It's they a very bad. It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Angie, okay, Angie <laughs> said it. Uh, like the the work it takes to get them on is not worth the content, if that makes sense. It really isn't. You know what I mean? A lot of them are like super woke and liberal. You know what I mean? So it's like, bro, I don't want to like, nah, man, like it's, it's not worth it a lot of the times. It really isn't. So I, I prefer uh, to bring on people that like value can give you all some good content and have some good discussions. OK, there's one more super chat from Jay it says, Myron, how many bodies do your girlfriends on the pod? No comment. <laughs> Let's keep going. That is everything. Fair enough. Thank you, guys. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, let's get back to the documentary. All right. On Jack the Ripper. And I see 1.3K likes, guys. Get it on! On the morning of November the 9th, a merchant and property owner named John McCarthy was going through his bookkeeping. McCarthy was the landlord of Miller's Court, and the tenants of Room 13 had fallen behind on their rent. McCarthy sent at once for his assistant, Thomas Boyer, to collect the money at the quarter to 11. After knocking twice without response, Boyer went around the corner to peer through a window. But his view was obstructed by a coat or curtain, so Boyer had to reach through a broken window pane to pull it aside. That's when he saw the severely mutilated body of a woman lying upon a bed in the corner of the room. Miller's court was soon crawling with police, but the door to room 13 was locked and had to be forced open with a pickaxe. What they found inside was truly the stuff of nightmares. The sight we saw, Pause. I cannot drive away. I have a photo of this, guys, but it is not safe for YouTube of this actual crime scene it was really bad i'll link it below in the description for oh, y'all i saw it yeah it's um crazy. angie do me a favor uh you have it move one of the okay you know what i'll drop the link for y'all in the chat yeah. keep keep running the, the the thing i'll go on the side and i'll put it in the chat for y'all okay. everyone's Wait saying they want to see it yeah of course they want to see it they're <laughs> all all crazy about gore and my uh mo said w medellin so i just wanted <laughs> to put that out there <laughs> kim you're gay <laughs> it looked more like the work of a devil than of a man. The whole scene is more than I can describe. I hope I may never see such a sight again. Dr. George Phillips described the body as, quote, cut all to pieces. Dr. Thomas Bond described the woman's face as, quote, hacked beyond recognition. The abdomen had been, quote, emptied of its viscera, while the throat had been, quote, severed all round down to the bone. The body had been monstrously disfigured with loose organs dispersed all around it. The room itself was sparsely furnished and offered little in the way of clues. Two tables, one or two chairs, and a small cabinet. Amongst the ashes of a fireplace, the police found patches of burned clothing. Had the killer tried to dispose of evidence, or had it merely been used for warmth and light? The victim was identified almost immediately. Her name was Mary Jane Kelly, and pause, she was the tenant of third. All right, guys, I dropped the link in the chat for y'all. So go ahead and take this time to look at the, uh, you guys can see the crime scene photo here and see how crazy Jack the Ripper really was. I pinned it in the chat right now. Oh, my God, this is so horrible. <laughs> yeah, don't show it on screen, I Angie. I didn't see the other ones. Yeah, don't show it on screen, <laughs> but y'all can go ahead. That link uh, there works. That is bad. It's Kim, pinned. You're sleeping with me tonight. <laughs> King Miller's court. But nearly pause, everything right, about pause, Kelly's pause, pause. life. Uh, everyone in the chat, y'all click that link. Yeah, y'all are looking. Okay, they're going <laughs> crazy in the chat right now. Yeah. Yeah, this dude, Jack, now y'all see. <laughs> this is crazy. Demon time, guys. Demon time. I can't show it on YouTube because obviously it's really graphic, but it's there for y'all to go ahead and look, you sick bastards. All right, let's keep running it. Fist shrouded in mystery. She was presumably of Welsh or Irish descent and in her mid-twenties, making her the youngest victim by far. But given that no matching records of a Mary Jane Kelly have Someone in the chat said Jack is a hibachi chef. Yo, what the fuck is wrong with y'all, bro? These are crazy. <laughs> Yo, what the fuck, man? The Mary Kelly picture is Yo. crazy. Dude, call them a hibachi chef, bro. Y'all are fucked up, man. <laughs>
Francis Cole looks sexy. Yeah, 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 guys, don't click that picture. Don't click that link if you're like faint, like if you're like squeamish or anything. And if like you that. just ate, don't click it. Yeah. Yeah. But I know a lot of you sick bastards out there want to see it, so I put it there for y'all. All right, let's keep running it. Been found. It's probable that she was using a fake identity. In any case, Kelly had not been living alone. Up until a few days before the murder, she had cohabited with a man named Joseph Barnett. They had only separated on October the 30th because Barnett disapproved of Kelly's prostitution and the people with whom she associated. But they did see each other again. On the evening of November the 8th, Barnett paid Kelly a visit. Upon his arrival, he found Kelly in the company of a woman who was just about to leave. Unfortunately, there are conflicting accounts about who this woman was, when Barnett arrived, and how long he stayed. If we choose to believe Barnett, he arrived at some point between 7 and a quarter to 8, and left before 9 o'clock. Shortly before midnight, Kelly was spotted in the company of a man by her neighbor, Marianne Cox. When Cox passed the couple, they were about to enter Kelly's room. Cox bid Kelly good night, but she was, quote, very much intoxicated and barely able to respond. Once they had gone inside, Cox could hear Kelly singing. When Cox then left the court about an hour later, Kelly could still be heard singing. By two o'clock, Kelly had apparently ventured back outside, for she was spotted by a man named George Hutchinson. The two of them were supposedly well acquainted, and Kelly had asked if he could spare a few coins. But Hutchinson was broke, and Kelly was desperate for money, so they soon parted ways. Moments later, Hutchinson observed Kelly being accosted by a well-dressed man. The two of them had a seemingly jovial interaction and began walking north. Buzz. Hutchinson found it suspicious that such a... So now you guys see, second time, that they've seen a well-dressed man, you know, involved in a situation with a woman that later ended up becoming a victim. Let's keep running it well-dressed man would seek the company of a woman like Kelly. As such, when the couple passed him by, he scrutinized the man's appearance. He was, for instance, carrying a pair of gloves in his right hand and a small parcel in his left. Hutchinson decided to shadow the couple as they proceeded to Miller's court. Before they vanished up the court, the man handed Kelly a red handkerchief and she had supposedly told him, All right, my dear, come along. You will be comfortable. Hutchinson remained in the vicinity until three o'clock, but neither Kelly nor the man reappeared. At roughly the same time, Cox returned home. In stark contrast to the loud singing upon her last departure, Cox was now struck by the complete absence of sound and light from Kelly's room. Finally, at approximately four o'clock, a tenant above and a woman across from Kelly's room heard cries of murder. The voice was that of a woman, and it appeared to emanate from nearby. Meanwhile, other denizens of the court heard no screams at all. According to Dr. Bond, Kelly died between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. Dr. Phillips placed the time of death a few hours later. But some witnesses were quite adamant that they had seen or even spoken to Kelly as late as 8 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Keep in mind that her body was discovered at the quarter to 11. These contradictions are difficult to reconcile, and the precise time of death eludes us to this day. Mary Jane Kelly is typically regarded as the Ripper's final victim, along with Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes. Pause. She's part of. And just so you guys know that link that I gave you, if you hit back, it'll uh, let you, you show all. all the victims. Um, actually, Angie, can you sh get the uh, the link that shows all the victims and put it in the chat yeah. and pin it? Yeah. I all right, Angie, got y'all right now. So we just showed you guys the link of the woman that was killed, but we'll put go ahead and put the link of the woman that uh, all five women you guys could see their their pictures. It's obviously not not as bad as the one you saw. So. They're bad as fuck as too. Nah, they're, they're bad, but you don't see as much blood and stuff like that. You yeah. just see, like, their face. You don't even it's, see their body. Thank God it's black and white. You know? Yeah, it's shitty quality, uh, so. Here it is. I, I, I pinned it for you guys. All right, cool. Go ahead, keep running the clip. All right. The canonical five. The five victims most likely to have been slain by the same hand. Martha Tabram might have been a victim of Jack the Ripper, but opinions are divided. 
the same is true of at least a handful of other cases. Even the canonical five are not without controversy, so the total number of victims is a matter of debate. Presuming that Kelly was indeed the final victim, one has to wonder why. Why did the murders come to such a sudden end? Did a ripper give in to fears of being caught? Were they imprisoned for a different crime? Pause. Perhaps they succumbed to an illness or... So as you guys know, you know, this happens a lot where a serial killer will be hot for a while and then they'll eventually kind of stop or then they sometimes come back and do things. Um, the most common ones that we've seen, guys, what? They have a family. Uh, they cool off for a bit. Um, they're, they get scared of the heat or whatever. They get arrested maybe. But the most common one I've noticed with BTK, the Golden State Killer, etc., they had families. So they just kind of chilled for a bit. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, apparently, allegedly having a family of children is probably one of the biggest ways to keep a guy from running around killing chicks. Let's keep going. Committed suicide. Could they have migrated to another country? Perhaps they deliberately changed their modus operandi to confuse the police. The possibilities are virtually endless, which means there is no shortage of suspects. Following the murder of Marianne Nichols, a rumor began to circulate that someone called Leather Apron was in the habit of abusing prostitutes. The name quickly made its way into the press, and soon enough it became synonymous with the killer. In fact, Leather Apron was the predominant pseudonym before Jack the Ripper. But the man identified as Leather Apron was soon cleared of all suspicion. His real name was John Pizer, and he was in a different part of London on the night when Nichols was attacked. This misguided manhunt is somewhat emblematic of the whole investigation. The police pursued even the most tenuous of leads due to a lack of evidence and mounting pressure from the public. They interviewed thousands, investigated hundreds, and developed numerous theories along the way. In the words of Inspector Frederick Abeline, Theories. We were lost almost in theories. There were so many of them. In an effort to narrow down the search, the police used a primitive form of criminal profiling. The idea was to analyze the available evidence to try and gauge what sort of person had committed the crimes. This profile was prepared by Dr. Thomas Bond, and he described the Ripper as a strong, middle-aged man with an inoffensive appearance who dressed respectably. Bond's most controversial assessment was that the killer possessed, quote, no scientific nor anatomical knowledge. This stood in direct opposition to the opinions of his peers, most of whom ascribed the Ripper with at least a basic understanding of anatomy. Based on the witness accounts, the Ripper was a man of average height with a medium to stout build in his late 20s to mid 30s. He wore dark clothes, including a hat of some sort, and had a mustache. But this sort of aggregation or tabulation of accounts can be quite deceptive. Not only are many details inconsistent, but they could be describing entirely different people. For all we know, none of the witnesses ever laid eyes on Jack the Ripper. So much is up for debate that one can build a case against almost any suspect. Some have even entertained the possibility that the Ripper was a woman or possibly a man disguised as a woman. While Jill or Jackie the Ripper is an interesting theory, it has failed to achieve any widespread support. What is rarely in dispute is that the Ripper was either arrested. I mean, I, I doubt the female conspiracy because, I mean, the veracity at which he attacked his victims, you, you have to be able to be extremely strong to inflict the deep wounds that he had and to be able to hold down an individual while you're attacking them like the way he did. So... Whoever Jack the Ripper was, was definitely someone who was physically strong uh, to be able to inflict that kind of damage. If you guys want an example of this, go back and look at the O.J. Simpson case that I did, which they shadow banned the fuck out that video because it's violent. It has age restriction and everything. But watch that O.J. Simpson episode I did and I actually give a pretty interesting uh, theory on who I think actually killed him. But um, you can see what the ferociousness of the violence and the stab wounds, etc., yeah, bro. It, it's you could tell when it's a man that and inflicted also, it versus a woman. And Go also ahead. because uh, the women were prostitutes, so might as well be be caught by a by a man that wanted like. Yeah, because they were probably engaging in some kind of fornication before or yeah, exactly. before or after. Yeah, so like they were killer, like I yeah. said. Yeah. 
So let's uh, run it back. And then, Kim, I think you knew one of the conspiracy theories. If they don't name it, then you tell them the other ones that come up. So this is the conspiracy theory side. Go ahead. President off or otherwise familiar with the East End. After all, he managed to narrowly evade capture on multiple occasions, which implies intimate knowledge of byways and patrol routes. He likely had some form of employment as the murders were committed around weekends and public holidays, and he may have had some degree of anatomical knowledge. With this unshakable profile in hand, let's take a closer look at a few suspects. The question is, where do we even begin? Oh my God, yeah, According to criminal suspects, profiler guys. and FBI special agent John Douglas, the Ripper was not only a local, but was likely interviewed by the police. If Douglas is correct, the Ripper might oh, be someone. Back. Just a tab it one sec. Yep. Uh, so it goes, investigators would have interviewed him during the course of the investigation. He was probably talked to by police on several occasions. Unfortunately, at this time, there was no way to cor correlate this type of information. Therefore, he was overlooked. I believe that too. Interviewed by the police. If Douglas is correct, the Ripper might be someone we've already met. Either a witness or a person close to one of the victims. What about John Richardson, the witness in the Chapman case who sat down on the backyard steps to trim a piece of leather from his boot? Richardson was indeed suspected by the police, but they found, quote, not a shred of evidence against him. His mother also lived on the premises, so he had good reason to be there. Then again, what kind of evidence could be held against someone in this era? Very little. They're going to have to rely heavily on circumstantial evidence, which, you know, we all know how circumstantial evidence works. It needs to work with other pieces of circumstantial evidence to paint a picture. They didn't have any um, concrete evidence back then that would that that would work like a DNA or something like that. That's extremely that's conclusive. Yet, so yet again, this was like, really tough times. Yet again, I mean, how they can pin on somebody if they didn't have any any evidence, like concrete evidence. What's concrete evidence on a case like this? Back in the 1800s, you would you would pr pr probably their strongest thing would be witness testimony. That's back it. Then. Back then, yeah, because they they're not going to be able to do forensics to the same degree. DNA, none of that existed back then. So their strongest evidence would probably be eyewitnesses back then. You see, guys, this is L for lame. Yeah, well, that's what it is. Back then. Yeah. What about George Hutchinson, the witness who followed Mary Jane Kelly? after she was accosted by a well-dressed client. Hutchinson never clarified his motivation for shadowing the couple. He merely stated that he was surprised to see a man so well-dressed in the company of a woman like Kelly. Was he surprised because he was concerned? Was he jealous? Was it about money? After all, Hutchinson was broke and the client appeared to be wealthy. Perhaps he waited outside the court with the intention of mugging this well-dressed client. There are many question marks surrounding Hutchinson. He has never been positively identified, so next to nothing is known about his life. This makes it very difficult to build a strong case against him. Hutchinson was interrogated by the police, but ultimately convinced Inspector Frederick Abeline that he was telling the truth. But not every witness attracted such attention from the police. Take, for instance, Charles Cross, the man who discovered the body of Maria Nichols. Pause. Now we're going to get into the suspects and uh, the evidence against them. So, uh... This was a conspiracy. He was never an actual suspect, but this was the conspiracy I was talking about. This is it? Yeah, okay. Do you want to talk more about it after we go through them? Um, I think they... Let's see what they cover. And then, okay, and then you can yeah. cover in the missing points. All right, let's do All it. All right. Okay. On the morning of August the 31st, Charles Cross left his home on Doveton Street and headed for work. When he turned into Bucks Row, he happened upon the body of Marianne Nichols. Moments later, he was joined by Robert Paul, and events transpired as previously described. Despite his proximity to the crime, Cross appears to have escaped suspicion from both the press and the police. He was evidently seen as the innocent passerby that he appeared to be. 
but in recent years that perception has been challenged. The argument is that Cross was in the act of committing the murder when he was interrupted by the approaching footsteps of Paul. Cross then concealed the murder weapon and portrayed himself as someone who just found the body. The injuries inflicted upon Nichols would be consistent with an interruption as they were less severe than those of later victims. What's interesting about Cross is that he likely testified under a false name. He claimed to be employed as a carman and his address was given as 22 Doveton Street. But surviving records show that in 1888, this address was occupied by a man named Charles Lechmere. Lechmere was also employed as a carman and on at least one occasion went by the name Charles Cross as it was the surname of his stepfather. It is now widely believed that Charles Lechmere was the man who appeared at the inquest and that he assumed the name of his stepfather when he testified. His motivation for doing so has been the source of much speculation. Was he trying to conceal his identity or was it merely a force of habit? After all, contemporary examples of people doing the exact same thing are not difficult to find. The most compelling evidence against Lechmere is that his morning commute between home and work roughly coincides with the time and place of the murders. Ah. Except for the murders of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, who were killed on a Sunday, the only day when Lechmere would have been free from work. Not only that, but all the murders were committed around weekends and public holidays. Why would a man who supposedly timed the murders with his morning commute gravitate towards days of rest? In any case, Lechmere's mother lived a few blocks south of Burner Street, the neighborhoods around which is also where Lechmere spent his childhood. As such, it's speculated that Stride and Eddowes were killed after Lechmere paid a late night visit to his mother. While he claimed to be employed at a delivery firm known as Pickford's, there are no surviving records of his employment. If he did work for Pickford's, there is a fair chance that he delivered meat. Pause. And with us, and you guys can remember that one of the witnesses said that they saw someone carrying a parcel. And what's this? Parcel Express. So some, uh, you know, some coincidences potentially. Let's keep going. And exposed to slaughter and blood on a daily basis. Lechmere remained in East London until his death in 1920 at the age of 71. While there is no evidence of Lechmere ever being suspected by the police, it is difficult to believe that he was completely overlooked. Many case files have not survived, so any doubts investigators might have had could have long since disappeared. Now, a witness who definitely attracted attention was Joseph Barnett. Pause. And the fact that he delivered meat, hey, might be familiar with anatomy to a certain level. You know, the doctors that um, came to the crime scenes and, and uh, gave their expert opinion, they said that the person that committed these murders had a crude understanding of an uh, anatomy to a degree. So yeah. that might coincide with like someone that deals with meat as a profession. And it gave him an excuse to have like blood on him and everything. There you go. Yeah. So that's, you know. Uh, th these are all things that could potentially link him to the crime. But again, this sucks because back then, in this era, it's very difficult to get concrete evidence. So you got to rely on what we just saw now, which is a bunch of circumstantial stuff. Let's keep going. Victor, I think this is going to be suspect too now. Joseph Barnett. Joseph Barnett was the man who lived with Mary Jane Kelly up until a few days before the murder. He and Kelly had supposedly met around April of 1887, and they eventually moved to 13 Miller's Court. Barnett was employed as a fish porter, but for reasons unknown, he lost his job between July and August of 1888. From that point onwards, the couple struggled to pay rent, and Kelly resorted back to prostitution. Now, those who believe that Barnett was the Ripper view his loss of employment as a turning point. The argument is that Barnett was so overcome with guilt and anguish for driving Kelly back to prostitution that he went on a murder spree, murdering one local prostitute after another in a desperate attempt to frighten Kelly off the streets. While most of this is pure speculation, it is true that Barnett disapproved of Kelly's prostitution. You may recall that Barnett separated from Kelly on October the 30th because he disliked the prostitutes with whom she associated. 
Kelly never went on the streets when she lived with me. She would never have gone wrong again, and I should never have left if it had not been for the prostitutes stopping by the house. This might further explain why Kelly was the Ripper's final and most viciously mutilated victim. Pause. The implication being that and that's where we sent you guys the link from before. Uh, don't don't look at that picture if you uh, you're eating. Which, by the way, guys, we got 1.8k. You guys watching almost 2,000, but we got 1.5k likes. Let's get to 100% engagement, guys. I roasted anus and reach all week, making fun of them, put hoods on, running around making a bunch of racial jokes. So if we do get canceled, I need you guys to like the video, so uh, and subscribe to the channel, man. Support the the movement, uh, and uh, yeah, man. Like the video. Let's get it up to 1,800 uh, likes, guys. Let's keep going. That Barnett felt rejected by Kelly and wanted revenge for the breakup. According to Barnett, he did pay Kelly a visit on the evening of November the 8th, but they had parted on, quote, friendly terms. He then supposedly went home, played a card game until half past 12 before going to bed. Now, Kelly is presumed to have died in the early hours of November the 9th, so Barnett could have returned to Miller's court sometime after midnight. While the police did subject him to four hours of interrogation, Barnett was ultimately released without charge. Then there's the matter of the locked door. When the police arrived at Miller's court, they had to force the door open with a pickaxe. This raised an important question. How did the killer lock the door behind him? Bam. According to Burnett, the key to room 13 had been missing for some time. Because of this, he and Kelly would, quote, open the door by reaching through the broken window. The door was said to be equipped with a, quote, catch lock and evidently locked itself upon being closed. If that's true, mystery solved. But even if the door was not self-locking, there's still an obvious solution. All the killer would have had to do is observe Kelly using the window trick and then employ that same technique to fasten the door upon leaving. But those who favor Barnett as the Ripper offer yet another solution. The key never went missing. Instead, Barnett is said to have stolen the key and then used it on the night of the murder. These solutions are all equally valid and it's impossible to know which one is correct. There is a slight variation of this theory which states that Barnett did murder Kelly but was not the Ripper. Instead, he merely emulated the Ripper to deflect attention away from himself. Pause. Once again... Th and these are all valid speculations, man. Um, I mean, if you guys look at that picture, it's very obvious that that was a personal attack. The mutilation was wild. Yeah. Please don't look at those pictures. Yeah, very <laughs> sick. Let's keep going. This is pure speculation, but the murder of Kelly did somewhat differ from the rest in that it was committed indoors. Burnett remained in the East End until his death in 1926, at the age of 68. While it's only natural for suspicion to fall upon witnesses and acquaintances, Victorian detectives did pursue other lines of inquiry. One prominent theory was that the Ripper suffered from insanity, and a prime suspect in that category is Aaron Kosminski. All right, pause. Guys, we're going to cover suspect three, Aaron Kosminski. Guys, I need y'all... We are 1.5K likes, but there's 1,800 of y'all watching. Guys, like the video. Free content. Doing a breakdown for y'all. Um, we could, you guys, uh, just like the video, man. That's all I'm asking, man. You don't got to donate a dollar to the show. Just support the channel, man. Like, you guys, the, the engagement is super important for the channel because the more times you guys like the video, the more you guys comment underneath, the more it's going to get pushed in the algorithm and someone else can go ahead and find the channel and enjoy the diverse. I don't think there's another true crime channel that's as diverse as we are, guys. We cover terrorism serial killers from the 1800s serial killers that are modern day we cover um national security cases with spies we cover investigations that i did when i was on a job we cover high profile cases all the way from from oj simpson in the 90s all the way to courtney clenny the only fans chick that killed her uh boyfriend like we absolutely have the most diverse um Amount of cases it. covered on this channel than anyone else. Hell, I covered bank robberies, you know, the bank heist in the 90s, uh, you know, of 19.8 million, uh, the biggest bank heist in history. Uh, the pizza bomber, you know. Uh, the DC sniper. The DC snipers, you know. Like, we are by far, that's why I, I keep saying I don't want to toot my own horn, but I really do think that we are the best true crime channel 
on YouTube because I'm the only person that actually did these investigations to can give you guys uh, a more refined approach with explaining how these types of cases work, etc. So like the channel, man. Or, or subscribe yeah. to the channel. Like this video. Let's get to 1,800 likes, man. And we're going to keep giving y'all this content because yeah. at the end of the day, guys, I'm going to be all the way 1,000 with y'all. I don't really make a profit from doing this channel. I actually lose money doing this channel because I spend a ridiculous amount of time researching and watching documentaries and picking out good cases for you guys um, that I could be using to do other things. But I genuinely enjoy and love this type of stuff. So I don't mind doing it. And I think you guys really enjoy it as well and benefit from it. And fuck it, man. We got to give you all the, the, the sauce, man. And so also, it's, I look at it. Hold on, Angie. Sorry. So I look at it like um, it's, it's to give you guys the content. So all I ask is, like the video, man, and uh, that's it. But go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say that you won't find uh, any background on, you know, background in, in federal agencies like Myron has uh, from the AG side. So what I was about to say. And also, we're getting off the shadow banning thing with the Fed React's name. So yeah, yeah, that's why we changed the name too, so yeah. it'll be easier for you guys to find. So I anticipate that this channel will blow up. But yeah, guys, when I was an agent myself, I wrote hundreds of affidavits. I arrested hundreds of people. I was involved in all different types of investigations. Um, so I'm able to kind of give you all an insight as to whatever case it was. Even if it's a state murder case, I still know how those are run too because I did a bunch of state cases. I've worked with the Texas Rangers before. I've done. I've been involved in murder cases, kidnapping cases, money laundering, everything, man. So um, yeah, man, like the goddamn video. You ain't going to get diversification like this when it comes to true crime anywhere else. So I do this for you guys, man. And it's not about the money. It really isn't. Because if anything, I lose money doing this channel because of all the time it takes to research. I spend more time. <laughs> probably shouldn't be admitting this. I spend more time researching for this channel than I do for Fresh and Fit. But I'm going to keep it all the way 1,000 <laughs> with y'all. Way more time is dedicated to this channel researching than, than Fresh and Fit. So um, like the content, man. That's all I ask. We got 1.6K likes. We should be at 1.8. Uh, but yeah, let's get back to it. And hell, Angie and Kim spend a lot of their time researching for you guys as well, too, man. So shout out to them. The team Whitechapel effort. Murders yep. investigation was overseen by numerous high-ranking officers within the Metropolitan Police. One of them was Assistant Commissioner Robert Anderson. Upon his retirement, Anderson repeatedly and unequivocally stated that Jack the Ripper had been identified. There was no doubt whatever as to the identity of the criminal. Without disclosing the name of the suspect, Anderson described him as a, quote, low-class Polish Jew who was, quote, safely caged in an asylum. Was. He'd been identified. <laughs> so this guy out here on that fucking, uh, I guess he didn't like the them boys. So he goes, quote, despite the uh, lucubration of many uh, an amateur Sherlock Holmes, there was no doubt whatsoever or whatever as to the identity of the criminal. The conclusion we came to was that he and his people were certain low-class Polish Jews before the mania seized him or after he had been safely caged in an asylum. And guys, just to give you guys an insight, um, anti-Semitism was rampant at this time in history, okay? Um, a lot of countries had um, conducted the practice of uh, exiling them boys. All right, for a multitude of different reasons, which I won't get into now because this is <laughs> because that's going to take forever. But um, England ended up exiling them boys later on as well. Uh, but yeah, there was, you know, it, it was common back then for them to have uh, anti anti Semitic belief systems. So uh, yeah, let's get back to it. Defined by a witness who was described as, quote, the only person who ever had a good view of the murderer. This unnamed witness had supposedly refused to testify because the suspect was, quote, a fellow Jew. I am almost tempted to disclose the identity of the murderer, but no public benefit would result from such a course. While Anderson never revealed the name of the suspect, his colleagues were a bit more forthcoming. Chief Inspector Donald Swanson revealed that his surname was Kosminski. Yet another high-ranking officer, Melville McNaughton, described Kosminski as a homicidal and misogynistic resident of Whitechapel. Surviving Pause. records show that Pause. Kosminski, a Polish Jew and resident in Whitechapel, this man became insane oh, owing to many years indulgence in solitary vices. He had a great hatred of women, specifically of the prostitute class, and had strong homicidal tendencies. He was removed to a lunatic asylum about March 1889. There were many circumstances connected with this 
man, which made him a strong suspect. And that comes from the chief constable, Melville uh, McNatton, if I pronounce that okay. right. Okay, here is where McNatton. I ask, what are strong homicidal tendencies? <laughs> you're either a killer or you're not. Yeah, he's probably just uh, saying strong homicidal ten tendencies because he's one of them boys. Right. That's probably why. Yeah, they didn't really like uh, them boys back then at all, especially in England. Then Aaron Kosminski was admitted to a psychiatric hospital in 1891. Aaron was indeed from Poland, he was Jewish, and had lived in Whitechapel. He suffered from auditory hallucinations and a paranoid fear of being fed by others. He was trained as a barber, but had, quote, not attempted any kind of work for years. It's unclear when his mental health began to decline, but upon being institutionalized, Aaron was deemed to be harmless. He was, quote, quiet and well-behaved and, quote, apathetic as a rule. Only on rare occasions would he get, quote, excited and violent. However, before his confinement, Aaron had once threatened his sister with a knife. The case against him largely hinges upon the claims made by Anderson, Swanson and McNaughton, especially the claim that an unnamed witness identified a suspect named Kosminski. But the descriptions of that suspect are not entirely consistent with Aaron Kosminski. For instance, McNaughton stated that the suspect had been, quote, removed to a lunatic asylum about March 1889. Aaron was first confined in 1891. Swanson wrote that the suspect had been, quote, sent to the asylum and died shortly afterwards. Aaron was still alive at the time and spent nearly three decades in psychiatric care. As such, it is possible that the suspect Kosminski was someone other than Aaron Kosminski. It's also possible that these inconsistencies were mere lapses in memory. After all, these events were accounted years or even decades after the fact, and McNaughton even confessed to writing solely from memory. <laughs> Regardless of the suspect's true identity Pause. and... And that's amateur police work, guys. You typically want to always write your reports immediately after you do an interview or you uh, do some type of investigative step so that it stays fresh in your mind. Um, I was real big on that when I was an agent myself. I would write my reports almost immediately, or if I didn't, I would record the interview or I would take meticulous notes. Um, but in general, you always want to go ahead and write that official report as soon as possible so that it's fresh in your head. Anderson was the only one who seemed gotta, convinced of his guilt. McNaughton ultimately favored a different suspect and stated that, quote, many homicidal maniacs were suspected, but no shadow of proof could be thrown on any one. Inspector Edmund Reed was of the same opinion. Now we have Sir Robert Anderson saying that Jack the Ripper was a Jew. That I challenge him to prove. I challenge anyone to prove that there was a tittle of evidence against man, woman, or child. So when Anderson wrote that there was, quote, no doubt whatever as to the identity of the criminal, he merely expressed his personal opinion. There was, in fact, ample doubt and no consensus amongst the police. But in recent years, Aaron Kosminski has been resurrected as a prime suspect due to a controversial DNA analysis. Okay, so back in 1888, acting sergeant Amos Simpson is said to have stolen a blood-stained shawl from the crime scene of Catherine Eddowes. This shawl was then passed down from one generation to the next before being submitted for DNA testing in 2011. DNA samples oh, were extracted oh, from the shawl and then compared against maternal descendants of Edos and Kosminski. In both cases, it was a match. If the subsequent news coverage is to be believed, the mystery has now been, quote, definitively solved. Pause. Aaron Kosminski Pause. was Jack the Ripper. Oh, Lee. Jack the Ripper was Polish immigrant Aaron Kosminski. Book claims, Russell Edwards claims Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old Polish immigrant who ended up dying in an asylum, was definitely categorically and absolutely the man behind the grisly killing spree in 1888 in London's East End. Edwards said a bloodstained shawl he bought in 2007 after an auction in Bury, St. Edmund, Suffolk, held vital DNA evidence which led to the killer. I've got the only piece of forensic evidence in the whole history of the case, he said. I spent 14 years working on it, and we have definitively solved the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. Holy! But let's see. Um how strong this thing stands. Uh, but that's crazy that they actually, the police officer stole a piece of evidence. That just goes to show like the fucking Bush League <laughs> type investigators they had back then. 
but he stole a piece of evidence and handed it down throughout the generations. And then someone finally went ahead and got it forensically tested. Someone said that we need him in Miami. We need who? Jack. But uh, as you can imagine. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's keep going. It's never quite that simple. First of all, the provenance or chain of custody of the shawl is severely lacking. There is no evidence Boss. of a shawl being found. Okay, let me explain what chain of evidence, a chain of custody is, guys. Okay, so when you go to a crime scene, right, and you take a piece of evidence, what you do is you have to pretty much, you know, put that evidence in a bag, seal it up. You're right. Who found it? What time they found it? What, who the witnesses were that found it, etc. Then you take custody of that evidence and you bring it to uh, an evidence locker. Okay. Uh, most agencies have some type of like big ass locker room where they have all the evidence lined up and it's sitting there by case number. Okay. So you have say, let's say you get a crime scene case numbers assigned. Then you go ahead, you find a piece of evidence there, maybe a bullet, a gun, whatever you take that gun, put it in a bag, seal it up with, obviously you grab it with gloves, write your name on it, you know, found by detective such and such, or found by special agent such and such. So you have, you get, have a witness there with you. They sign, you seal it up, done. Then you physically transport it to the evidence locker room or you turn it over to somebody that will go ahead and do it for you. That piece of evidence gets something uh, gets something called the chain of evidence log with it, okay? Uh, in the government, uh, when I was working for uh, Homeland Security, it was called a 6051. Yeah, we're getting into details now, okay? And that's the customs form that uh, HSI uses, it's customs that Border Protection uses, Border Patrol. It's called a 6051. And that's what it's called. And you guys can go ahead and Google. I'm sure you guys can probably see it. A 6051S for seized, right? <clears throat> uh, so anyway, you write on there the item, the line number it is. Maybe it's the first piece of evidence you find. So it's line item number one. And then what it is, you describe it. You initial it, blah, 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 day and time, date it. And then you go ahead and transport it to the evidence guy. Once you give it to the evidence guy, he takes the chain of custody. He signs it and it should be in his custody, right? or whoever touched in between. But the long story short is this, guys. When you get a piece of evidence, it needs to be uh, documented, logged, sealed, and every person that touches that piece of evidence needs to be uh, documented on that chain of custody. Clearly, you know, the police back in the 1800s, right, in the late 1800s, didn't know this, and one police officer stole a fucking piece of evidence from the case. So... We don't have a chain of custody. We don't know how legit it is. We don't even know if it actually came from that crime scene officially, right? Like we can't 100% conclusively prove that. So that is why the chain of evidence is so important. And as a matter of fact, the chain of evidence is what the defense attacked in the OJ Simpson case and why OJ Simpson was able to walk free. They attacked the evidence in that chain of custody, man. So that is the importance of chain of custody. And that is what chain of custody is. Dump the We're going to get a more in-depth description of that, but I need you guys to like the goddamn video. We're at 1,700 likes right now. We need 1,800 likes, man. 100 more likes because I'm giving y'all some sauce. Uh, uh, Byron, yeah, go ahead. Would it be the same for, for the police in England? Like this? It should agency? be, yes. All law enforcement agencies typically have a chain of custody. Some use different terms for it, et cetera, right? Like, like I said before, HSI, we call it a 6051 form, um, but... Every uh, every police agency, whenever you're seizing evidence, there needs to be a chain of custody so that when you go to court and you testify, the, every person that touched that piece of evidence can be called in to testify that they handled the evidence. That's why it's so important, so that it could be used in court. All right, All right let's get back to the crime it. scene. Like the video, you know, guys. Is there any evidence of Simpson ever being at the crime scene? Furthermore, a destitute woman like Edos is unlikely to have owned such an expensive item. Second of all, the type of DNA used to identify Edos and Kosminski was mitochondrial DNA, the powerhouse of the cell. This type of DNA is passed down through the female line and is not unique to any one individual. Thousands can share the same mitochondrial DNA, which means it can't be used to pinpoint a specific person. In the words of a geneticist, based on mitochondrial DNA, one can only exclude a suspect. Ah. So to say that the mystery has been definitively solved is widely inaccurate there's still plenty of room for doubt. So, to recap, a suspect named Kasminski was identified by an unknown witness. This was enough to convince at least one senior officer of his guilt. That suspect may have been Aaron Kasminski, a man who was largely non-violent, but once threatened his sister with a knife. Aaron can neither be incriminated nor eliminated by the DNA evidence. He spent the rest of his life in psychiatric care 
and died in 1919 at the age of 53. Kosminski was not the only suspect advanced by a high-ranking officer. A completely different suspect who still falls into the same category is Francis Tumblety. Two days before the murder of Mary Jane Kelly, an American physician named Francis Tumblety was arrested in London. As you can probably tell from this photograph, Tumblety was quite an eccentric character. He was born in Ireland around 1833, but was raised in the United States. From an early age, Tumblety gained a reputation for being a medicaster or quack doctor. He engaged in all sorts of medically dubious practices and advertised himself as the Indian herb doctor. He promised to cure anything from dyspepsia and scurvy to cancer and blindness using nothing but medicinal Pause. herbs. Uh, and like I told you guys before, this kind of goes to show y'all the primitive uh, state of medicine back then in the late 1800s. So, you know, it's very probable that those doctor that sh doctors that showed up at those scenes saying, yeah, she's been dead for at least two hours or whatever. They could be wildly inaccurate. And you guys can see with that first murder, well, those first few murders, um, timelines weren't matching up, witness accounts weren't matching up, etc. with the doctor situation. So it's very probable the doctors could have been doctors could have been wrong as well. When he was not posing as a doctor, Tumblety was busy running from the law. He was either accused or convicted for crimes like theft and assault, attempt to induce a miscarriage, and manslaughter of a patient. He was even implicated in the assassination of US President Abraham Lincoln, but was ultimately cleared of suspicion. Now, in the early 1860s, Tumblety is alleged to have hosted a lavish dinner party in Washington. Only men were invited to this dinner, and Tumblety had supposedly expressed fierce hatred of women. Furthermore, he showcased a cabinet in his office in which he stored a vast collection of jars filled with anatomical specimens, some of which were said to contain the wombs of, quote, every class of woman. In 1869, Tumblety ventured across the Atlantic and visited England for the first time. By his own admission, he roamed the streets of London until he became familiar with every part of it. He advertised himself as the great American doctor and had a few skirmishes with the police. After a few more voyages between the old world and the new, Tumblety found himself in London in the autumn of 1888. The purpose of his visit and whereabouts at the time of the murders are completely unknown. Tumblety never stayed in one place for long and made frequent use of false names. There is a story of a mysterious lodger leaving behind a blood-stained shirt near the murder site of Elizabeth Stride. This supposedly happened on the night of the murder, and some believe that this lodger was Francis Tumblety. But there is no firm evidence of that, and the entire incident is fraught with uncertainty. What we do know is that Tumblety was arrested in London on November the 7th. According to the press, as well as Tumblety himself, he was arrested on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper. Two days later, Mary Jane Kelly was found brutally murdered, and it's unclear whether Tumblety was still in custody or had already been released on bail. Nevertheless, he was ultimately charged with four counts of gross indecency, which had nothing to do with the murders. But Tumblety had no intention of standing trial. Instead, he made his way across the English Channel, boarded a steamship under a false name, and fled back to America. He was pursued by detectives and kept under surveillance, but his offenses were, quote, not extraditable. As such, Tumblety remained in the United States and never returned to England. So to recap, Francis Tumblety was a misogynistic medicaster who was in London at the time of the murders. He even showcased a collection of wombs, and the Ripper did indeed extract the womb from two of his victims. I mean, he sounds like the perfect suspect perhaps a bit too perfect. There is no doubt that Tomlety was in London in 1888, but the claim that he was a misogynistic collector of human body parts is extremely dubious. It can be traced back to a single article from December of 1888, featuring an interview with a man named Charles Dunham. Dunham had a long history of spreading misinformation and has been described as a pathological liar, a forger, and a conman. He was even convicted of perjury. 
As such, there is every reason to believe that this story is a complete fabrication. Furthermore, Tamlati was both older and taller than the men described by most witnesses. Tamlati was said to be, quote, an enormous man who liked to dress in flamboyant and militaristic outfits. It's difficult to imagine a tall, pompous American sneaking around the streets of Whitechapel virtually undetected. On the other hand, it's unclear which, if any, of the witness accounts can be trusted. Then there's the matter of the rings. You may recall that two brass rings were stolen from the body of Annie Chapman. It's suspected that the rings were taken by the Ripper to be kept as trophies. Now, upon his death in 1903, Tumblety left behind a quite impressive estate. But among his many valuable possessions were a pair of inexpensive imitation rings. Could they have been the same rings taken from the body of Chapman? It's possible. It's also impossible to prove. Chief Inspector John Littlechild regarded Tomlety as a quote, very likely suspect. And it's not difficult to see why. If the many rumors about them are to be believed, Tomlety had both opportunity and motive to commit the murders. But therein lies the problem. Much of what we know about Tomlety is founded upon unsubstantiated rumors. Tomlety himself was an attention-seeking charlatan with no qualms about lies and deception. With a suspect like that, one can never be certain where the lies end and the truth begins. And also, pause, he was arrested right around the time that one of the murders happened. So it, it's, it's, is it probable that he would commit a murder like right after he got arrested, assuming he got bond? Eh, who knows? You know what I mean? Like if he wants that kind of attention on himself. Um, and he sticks out and did, what didn't match the descriptions of the other witnesses. All right, let's uh, finish up this thing. Let's go back to it. I think this is done. It's done. I think the outro is left, That's, right? Yeah, this is the outro. Hold on. Let's make sure. To theorize about the identity of Jack the Ripper is to navigate a minefield of hearsay, sophistry, and contradictions. Entire encyclopedias have been dedicated to the compilation of suspects, and with every passing year, they seem to grow ever more expansive. Even though there are hundreds of potential suspects, only a dozen or so are worth more than a brief consideration. Some of the more sensational contenders include famous authors and artists, <laughs> yeah. as well as high-ranking officers and members of the royal family. But these grand conspiracies and elaborate deceptions seem hopelessly contrived against the sheer simplicity of a suspect like Charles Lechmere, an unassuming Pause. delivery man. Was there anything you want to add on this guy, uh, Kim? Because this was the first guy that they thought was... Yeah, it. so... They covered basically everything, but he gave a fake name, a fake address. Um, he also stated that he was never alone with the body, when in reality he was alone with the body um, for nine minutes. Before went, the second guy came yeah. up on that work, uh, that walk to work. Yeah, yeah, and after doing investigations, this was like one of the only bodies that he didn't really like go crazy on mm -hmm. because he didn't have the time to because he heard the footsteps of the other person coming gotcha and when they did like more like investigations on it it only took two to three minutes to kill her and he was alone with her for nine minutes gotcha okay interesting all right uh let's keep running it on his way to work personally i remain unconvinced that jack the ripper has even been identified as a suspect the few covered in this video are probable candidates, but it's still possible to make persuasive arguments against them. The same is true of all those left out by necessity. None of them can offer anything more than ambiguity and circumstance. With a suspect pool in the hundreds, that might seem improbable. But London was the largest city in the world, home to the largest port in the world. It was a city of millions, with a large population of poorly documented drifters. It's not difficult to imagine one lowly sailor, butcher, medic, soldier, barber, merchant, porter. Yo, shout out to Lamino. That was a fantastic documentary. <laughs>
Go ahead and support his YouTube channel. Give that a like real quick, Angie. Scroll down. Give that. Give him a like. Shout out to Lamino. Uh, he hasn't posted in a while, but awesome content. I'll link it below for y'all if you guys want to watch it uninterrupted without uh, our commentary. Uh, let's go ahead and hit the chats real quick and uh, close this bad boy out. You guys could be anywhere else in the world, but you're still here with us. So like the video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, go ahead, uh, Kim, you got it, because I can't. J-Rob, GC, and Team Energy 199. Myron's right about the rappers. They're all cap four bucks. Yeah, it's just, it's just this, you know, the quality of the interviews is not worth the headache that you have to deal with getting them on the show. Simply put, guys. Um, Big Mo says, Jack the Ripper chuffing up and cooking a woman like another episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mo, man, in the chat. Um, TRC 23, Jack the Ripper was part of the royal family. That's why they could not solve the crimes. Okay. All right. That's one theory. The IRS says, now nah, this Jack the Ripper is wild. Boy, he's probably in hell getting his cheeks beat by Satan. <laughs> Shout out to uh, IRS. I appreciate that, my friend. J Soul Life says, Jack was selling dreams and taking spleen. <laughs> 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 Yeah, the chat got no chill, man. <laughs> what the fuck, bro? Jack the River gave women less than anyone in history. <laughs> That's true. He took more. Squint Daniel says, hey, Myron, a cool case for you to cover would be the Junko for Furata. He was a he was Japanese, Japanese. She was a Japanese girl kidnapped, tortured for 44 days and murdered by her classmates. Yes, we, we have that on the list. We have we have that on the list that that case that was that one's that really was, graphic. That's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, that one's really graphic. But yeah, we we have that one on the list. Go ahead. Rob says Green River Killer said if he had a nice woman to go home to, he might have not killed. Love the show, Myron. Keep it up. No, uh, so funny thing, the Green River Killer actually did have a wife, guys. But uh, he got he got it after the killings. No, I think he, no, he kept killing when he was with her. Yeah, he did, but he stopped for a while after he got married, and then he he continued killing. Yeah, but he's saying that if he had a good woman, he wouldn't he wouldn't wouldn't be killing. That was a lie. Maybe she wasn't a good woman. <laughs> I mean, he he moved her in. They had a long relationship. Like she had no clue what he was doing. But the point is, is that allegedly he was married. Well, that no, she even said it in in the in her interview that she had no clue he was a good man to her. She had zero clue that he was doing all this demon time stuff on the side. Like he moved her in, he took care of her. It was like a dream relationship. And when uh, he got arrested, she was like caught off guard. So I would say he had a good marriage, a very good one. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until he got married, uh, until he got arrested that um, everything came to light and he did a good job of living a double life. But yeah, bro, I mean, um, but he definitely had a chick, but he was still acting crazy. But hang on, wasn't what? that the Green River Killer killing before getting married? And yes. then he got married, it stopped. And then he started again? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Manny says, hey, Myron, just know you guys have a lot of fans in the San Francisco, SF? San Francisco, no? SF, uh, operator side spe of SF Special Forces operator side of the military. Shout out to you, my friend. I got, I, I know y'all support me for sure. Um, the after, after our shows, keep us uh, entertained and the daytime is great knowledge, uh, especially the financial side. Yeah, absolutely, man. We help, yo, I love helping government employees like get another uh, income. And uh, tomorrow we're going to actually talk about how to make money on Amazon, guys. So for all you guys out there that want a side hustle, etc., this is going to be a fantastic one for y'all. Okay. Mo says, woman would rather share a Jack the Ripper than to be saddled with a faithful mom trail. Milkman. <laughs> He's saying he's saying uh, they'd rather basically be with Jack the Ripper than Abba. <laughs> um, Boy says Jack ripped on more women than Myron does in the after hours. Facts. Podcast. That dude was out here slashing and dashing. <laughs> All right. What Darnell else? now says or property of the de deceased in the suspect's po possession was considered proof of guilt. We were talking about early. She asked earlier um, what would be considered like solid proof. Mm -hmm. so he was saying yeah was, that could be yeah 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 you you search the house yeah that's that's um david said and you got the hoodie myron looking good mirroring w yeah he got it bro cold. and we also keep the studio cold freezing cold. yeah big mo says hey myron when are we gonna have jack the ripper as a guest on after hours we'd love to see him chop it up with the ladies <laughs> this guy bro <laughs> thank you mo i appreciate it 
motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> Debbie Martin, 20 bucks. When will you do an episode on the cocaine fueled six foot four Armenian stalking young Latinas or across Miami? I don't know when I'll do that one, man. Zerka might do his own show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, Darna Elliot, what do you think about the syphilis theory? Back then, penicillin didn't exist, and late stage syphilis causes you to go mad, which is why he targets prostitutes. Potentially, I mean, that's actually what killed uh, Al Capone, guys. Go watch the episode that we did on Al Capone. Um, that fucked him up, so and he ended up like getting deterioration of the brain, etc. Uh, anything else? Yeah, Devon says, put my mother onto your Fed Reacts content, bro. She asked if you ever, if you've ever looked into JFK Jr. I. Uh, yeah, we're gonna cover we're gonna cover uh, JFK extensively when um, you know we're gonna cover the magic bullet theory, J J everything, man. Oswald Rubenstein, if you know what I'm saying, Jack Ruby. Okay, we're gonna cover all that stuff, guys, for y'all when I bring uh, Ryan Dawson on. Okay. Anything else? That's all. Cool, uh, ladies. What is well, you guys? What's your last words for the people before we close this thing out? Um, this was an interesting case. It was not. <laughs> um when i researched it out a lot of the videos were the same and they had the same it's all conspiracy theories it was it was a nice video um yeah that's yeah lamino's video is very well done shout out yeah, to him yeah he did a good job um yeah that's about it uh you know what i think about this case uh the documentary definitely of w is amazing well very well done i love lamino it's great love their documentaries but yeah the case is boring Fair enough. Angie doesn't like uh, slashers from the 1800s. Um, yeah, guys, I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle with this one. Uh, you guys have been requesting it forever, so I said, let's do it. Um, and obviously, you know, it, it is a fact he's the most famous serial killer of all time, I would argue. Um, if you, th you know, he's up there, you know, you think of serial killers, names that come to mind are automatically always going to be Jack the Ripper, Ted Bundy, um, uh, the Zodiac Killer, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Like, these are names that always come up. BTK, Green River Killer, Samuel Little. So, you know, you guys asked for it. We're going to make it happen. You know, it doesn't fuck our feelings. It doesn't matter what we feel like or what we necessarily want to do. We give you guys what you guys want. You know, the DC snipers, right? You guys wanted that one. We covered it for y'all. Mm -hmm. So just keep giving us requests, guys. Um, we're going to give you guys what you want, regardless of how we feel about the case. Like I said before, Angie doesn't like this case, but hey, we're doing it anyway, because, yes. you know, you guys are the ones that dictate how we do this show. Because like I said before, this show isn't necessarily designed to make money. It's more to give y'all what you guys want, give y'all some entertainment and give you guys some education and explain to you guys how the law enforcement side works. I mean, hell, y'all got a full, you know, one-on-one class on uh, chain of custody and how that works as well, which I've never really seen explained to that detail on YouTube. Uh, any, did anything else come yeah, in? Yeah, we All have right. one more chat. All right, cool. It says from Martin, modern day po policing has really advanced in London. Now the police officers have batons and pepper spray they wave <laughs> rainbow flags in the streets they arrest people for saying mean words also they really con they really conquered the knife crime well done uk <laughs> Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. Um, London is a failed society, man. You you guys have really bad knife crime. The police don't even have guns. They're super liberal. You can get arrested for a tweet. It's crazy, man. Um, London has become definitely a fucking <laughs> clown world. Okay. Um, um, uh, Martin said you skipped my fifty dollars super chat. No, we, we just got read you. That. We got you, bro. We got you. Um, I, I, I agree with you that London is is a failed society. All jokes aside, no, nowhere will any of y'all compare Myron's critical thoughts to the white Fulani cattle headman. I think he's making fun of uh, Apple or Leech, one of the two. Yeah. Um, the white Fulani, and big, that big chunk just goes. Uh, in your opinion, do you think? Who, who do you, do you think, think was Jack? Jack? Um. It could have been that first guy that found him or guys, remember, so many immigrants, so many poor people coming in and out of that part of London. It could have been some random dude that saw an opportunity to attack a bunch of drunk whores on the street and get away with it, you know, and like it wasn't like they had licenses back then or driver's licenses or excuse me, like IDs, like people were just coming into London and just like living, you know what I mean? Because there are so many immigrants in the area, like people were undocumented. So it would have been easy for someone who's like just a, a stray hell a gypsy passing through to commit these crimes and not get caught so yeah that was tough man and then jm just jam thank you so much five bucks super sticker yeah. mm -hmm. um cool uh guys hope you guys enjoyed that one uh that was jack the ripper don't forget to like the video subscribe we to got the channel two more. oh okay, okay. <laughs> last minute guys here jm said you should do an episode on chris it's on the list 
Okay. Chris Benoit is on there. Okay. Yes. Chris Benoit is the uh, the crippler, the Canadian crippler. He was a famous wrestler uh, back in the day that killed himself and his family. Out and in Canada. then Martin got again. Robert Picton and Chris Benoit there. What was that? Yeah, we also got Robert Picton. You guys have been requesting yeah. that one. Yeah. And Chris Benoit. Those yeah. are two main Canadian cases. And then Martin says, "Great job, all making Chris look even more like a bum." <laughs> Appreciate it, my friend. Uh, shout out to Chris. He helps. Uh, he does his job, even though we make fun of him. But uh, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Don't forget to like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, thank you to Angie and Kimberly for helping me out on this. And uh, yeah, guys, we're going to go eat. Uh, Angie, go ahead and hit that brand button there. and hit. I'm a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Okay, guys, HSI. Friend of Jeffrey Williams and Associate Wesley.